Hi guys, welcome to today's session, the long-awaited session that you've been asking for. Uh, we have the most famous speaker throughout this internship, Dr. Mustafa Arabi back. Dr. Mustafa, welcome. Uh, just Thank for you. future reference, uh, I'll just introduce Dr. Mustafa really fast. I know you guys know him like the back of your hands, but uh, I'm just going to introduce him anyway. Uh, Dr. Mustafa Arabi has 25 years of experience in the petroleum industry. He holds a PhD degree from North Carolina State University in the USA and a master's and a bachelor's degree from Alexandria University. Dr. Arabi also joined Alexandria University in an early career as an assistant lecturer till he obtained his master's degree. He also used to teach at community colleges in the USA. Uh, in the industry, uh, he held many positions in all aspects of the child industry and lived many in many countries around the globe. So, guys, uh, this is how this session is going to work. Dr. Mustafa have recorded, has, sorry, has recorded all your questions that you've left on the uh, Facebook post. And he will be answering them according to the category in the Q&A session. Throughout the lecture or throughout the session, he will be asking you some questions. The answers to these questions from your side will be in the chat box, right? And then if you have any further questions, you're going to leave this in the Q&A part. So it's easier for me to reach whichever um, I'm going to reach at that point. So again, his question, answer it in the chat box. If you have a question, ask it in the Q&A box, okay? Thank you, Dr. Mustafa, over to you. Thank you, Engineer Nihal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you guys, wherever, wherever you are. Uh, as uh, Engineer Nihal actually just uh, mentioned, there are uh, multiple questions that you guys posted on the uh, webinars and uh, by Petro. Uh, so I actually collected all these questions, then I put them in categories. So we'll take uh, one category at a time to go through your questions and, and answers. Some of the questions are uh, very long uh, questions to answer. So I will try to handle this in a different way. I'll, we'll talk about this later when we reach to these questions, okay? Right. So first of all, thank you very much for you guys, your feedback, your comments, uh, your participation, and, and all this in all these webinars. It seems like you, uh, you like the way I teach. Uh, through the, uh, the webinar, actually, I'll tell you how, how do I look at things, how do I think of things, uh, so you can actually capture uh, how, to, um, how to master any subject based on where to start, how to start, and what to look for, okay? One very important thing, guys, you need to think of is never, ever ask about an equation. Equation is the last thing to think about, okay? This is a very important thing that you need to keep in mind as engineers. Engineers are not after questions. We are not mathematicians. We are engineers, okay? Engineer, first of all, you have to understand the concept. Because when, when you understand the concept, the equation comes to model the concept, not the other way around. Never ask about the question. Asking a question is not an engineering thing. Uh, if you ask about questions, you know, uh, I'm sorry, equations, uh, this means that you are looking from backward uh, or studying backward, which is the wrong way to study engineering. Second is, when you hear about anything, please never forget to ask why all the time. Because if you ask why all the time, you will understand exactly why people are doing this. Why did even think of this? What is the reason for a scientist to come up with this idea? What is the, is the reason that the scientist even repeats another idea with a different way? For sure, there is a good reason. And if you know the reason, you will never forget it. Okay? But if you are after what is the equation that he used, what, is the, what are the parameters he's using, that's a mathematician type work. That's not an engineering type work. Okay? Plus, when you are an engineer, never accept anything that doesn't make sense. One of the things that we will dis discuss in length today, which is a negative porosity that everybody's talking about, you know, for, for almost uh, two months now. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll answer that question. Make sure that you guys understand it. Uh, understand that there is nothing in nature called negative porosity. We'll understand the reasons why sometimes we see negative porosities. Okay. Uh, the last thing that you need also to take care of 
uh, to really master any subject is to know why they call the subject this name. So, for example, why do we call capillary pressure capillary? What's a capillary? What's a capillarity? Why do you call it capillary? Why do you name it that name? Okay, because if you know why they name things the name it is, believe it or not, 90% of the understanding of a subject and when you ask why they call it this way. For example, we spent a long time, last time, talking about absolute permeability. Why do you call it absolute? Why do you call it uh, uh, relative? Why, why do you call it that way? Okay. Why do you call it interfacial? Why do you call the, uh, the forces between two fluids interfacial? Why do we call the, the forces between a fluid and the surface adhesion? You have to understand this. Sometimes you need to go back to even the basis. You need to go back, but most of these words actually are not even English words. As you will see today, capillary is not an English word. Uh, when I was teaching the unconventional at the American University, when we started talking about pyrolysis, I mean, I left the class for the whole class, asking them what is pyro what, what does pyrolysis mean? That's not an English word. Okay, so why we call it pyrolysis? Now, when you go back and find out what what's the meaning of pyrolysis in Latin, you will know exactly what the subject is all about. Okay, so please. When you see a name, go find out the roots of the name because the one who names something is the one who knows how to name it. I always give him an example, which is a very interesting example, actually. We all know what, what, what is a triangle. Everybody knows what a triangle, I'm very sure. Is it a good name? It's actually a very wrong name. Why? Because the European, actually, they did not discover the triangle. The triangle discovered hundreds of years ago when Europe was in the Dark Ages. They didn't have any science, okay? So when they came, they named it after something that you don't even understand. In Arabic, okay, and I'm sure, um, I'm sure some, of my, uh, some of you actually speak Arabic, we call it musallas, not a triangle. Triangle means triangle, three angles. Three angles does not make always a triangle. I can draw three angles without actually closing the sides. You, you can draw angle one, angle two, angle three. They don't even close. They don't make a triangle. But if you look at the Arabic meaning, it's actually musallas, means three of everything, three angles and three sides. So that's the right way of calling it. Why? Because the Arabs were one of the uh, discover of all these geometrical things that was all before even Europe was into science. So, what, what my point is, when you name something, when a scientist names something, he names it for a reason. Go find out why he called it this way. If you know why he called it this way, you will know all the conditions. You will know all, all the parameters he's using. You know all the methodology he's applying. If you know how to name the name, okay? So these are things that I always use in my, in my studying, in my research. I have to find out why people are doing this, why people are calling this, because that's, that's as I've told you, this is 90% of the understanding, okay? All right. With that said, let's just go for a, an overview of the questions. You are, guys, you have so many, many questions. I listed some of it in one page. It is a second page with another list of questions. It is a third page of an, another list of questions. So there are so many, many questions here. Uh, they are, you know, uh, touching different subjects. So I will try to categorize them, them based on subjects. And we, I will try to, uh, to answer uh, as many of them as I can. Uh, expect a very long webinar for at least two, two and a half, three hours. For sure, I will take a break uh, to make some coffee or, 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 or to get uh, relaxing or, or do something stretch, guys. And, uh, We'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue on that, okay? So let's start. The first subject that you guys talked about is the fluids in the pore space, okay? I actually received three questions regarding the fluids in the pore space. That actually goes back on repeating few things that I covered when I was talking about the fluids distribution in the pore space, okay? And today I will, I will elaborate even more on them try to find out what, what are you guys asking uh, about and, and why, why was the confusion that you guys have. The first question is how, can, how we can determine the interfacial tension. 
how can we calculate interfacial tension? Okay. First of all, you know what interfacial tension is. So it's the forces between two different fluids. Okay. Why we call it interfacial? Because it's actually between, it's an enter between two faces, two faces of fluids, faces one and faces two. Faces is a, is a word that means it's a different content. Okay? So you have content one, you have a content two, and in between them, because they are different, naturally there is a force in between. Okay, so that's called interfacial force. Let me start with the with the, the, uh, just a review of what we covered before. Here are the pore, and here are the fluids. Okay? We identified different type of forces and different type of fluids. Fluids that are very close to the grains. We call it we call it what? We call it the forces that are attached to the grain with a force that called adhesive forces. Adhesion means glue. It's glued. Okay, it's a glue. It's glued to the surface. Okay, so when you glue something to something, you glue to the surface. Okay, so as if you're, the fluid is glued to the surface. Right? And that type of water we call it irreducible because it is glued to the surface. It will never leave the surface. Okay. Then you have another water, another layer of water. Okay, this layer of water is adjacent to that one. It's far from the grains, so it is not in adhesion forces with the grains. Okay. So it's the same water, so it has a force between water and water. They are not two different fluids, they are not two different faces. If they are not two different faces, we call this force cohesion force. So the cohesion force is actually a force between molecules in the same fluid. Right? Now we have a third fluid which migrated to your pore, which is which is your oil. Oil is different than water. Then between oil and water, because they are two different phases, that's where the force we call interfacial forces. Okay, so that's why we call it that way. So the adhesion is a glued fluid to the surface. Cohesion is a, is a is a molecule to molecule in the same fluid, and interfacial is a molecule to molecule in two different fluids. It's very simple, right? Here is what you actually study and you, and you look at in the, in the textbooks. You see forces here between fluids and surface and forces between fluids and fluids. So this is surface water. So the water is attached to the surface by, by, ad, by adhesion or cohesion, by adhesion, okay? Oil is attached to the surface by adhesion. So this is an adhesion forces and this is an adhesion forces. Within the oil, there is a cohesion forces. We don't actually talk about this. We don't measure this even because it's a fluid. Okay, we're expecting this. You can actually measure measure it outside the pore space. It's it's the same. It's not going to be affected. Probably with a little bit of temperature and pressure, it may change a little bit. But it's still it's still a cohesion forces. So we don't actually measure cohesion forces. We measure the adhesion forces because that's a strange or a foreigner surface with my oil or a foreigner surface with my water. But between the oil and the water, I'm very interested because oil actually came later into the pore space. So I need to find out what is the force between that water and the visitor to my pore. The visitor to my pore is the hydrocarbon. So between my original water and my visitor, there's an interfacial, two different faces, two different fluids. So there is an interfacial forces between the two liquids. Okay? All right. The second question that you guys ask about was the difference. I'm, I'm still gonna continue more on that. Okay, I'm just I'm just uh, looking at the the whole the whole uh, question so far. The difference between entry pressure, displacement pressure, and capillary pressure. Actually, I listened to one of the uh, webinars also about the uh, the uh, lab laboratory measurement, and I think there was also something else that was called uh, uh, for the in, for the entry pressure it was called as a threshold. Pressure. So we'll talk about this also, the threshold pressure and why we call it that way. Okay? So we'll, talk, we'll talk about this. But when we discussed this, we discussed it in the capillary pressure. Okay? And we'll talk about the capillarity for in, in a second. And what is, what is the meaning of capillarity to, for you to not, not to memorize it, but to understand exactly what capillarity is. Okay? So we'll talk about the cap pressure. We'll talk about how, why we call it that way, how we measure it, and how we measure the forces in between. The third one is their capillary pressure in unconventional reservoirs. What's the recovery factor for unconventional reservoirs? 
to tell me what to tell you what the recovery effective unconventional reservoir that needs actually at least three to four lectures. So I will leave this later on between Dr. Ahmed and myself, who probably will agree to some other webinars to discuss these things in, in some in some depth. But for the capillary pressure unconventional reservoir, remember any fluid that rises up even within the zone or outside the zone has to have capillarity. Take it as minimum. We'll talk about this in some length later. Any fluid who rises up, okay? Any fluid, I'm gonna say it again, any fluid who rises up, okay? That fluid has to have capillarity. Right? That's the only reason, that's the only way that the, that the fluid will rise up. So fluids rise up because of the capillarity. Since you have fluid that's moving within the source rock, okay, so it's rising up within the source rock, so these fluids will have some capillarity. Is it the same as capillarity of rock that has porosity? No. It will be completely different capillarity, but there is capillarity there in the source rock, okay? All right? Let's just talk one by one. Forces inside the pore space. The question was, and we have adhesion forces, we have cohesion forces, and we have interfacial forces. The adhesion forces, as we said, between the wetting phase and the rock, cohesion forces between the molecules in the same fluid, and interfacial forces are between the two different fluids, the oil which is coming into our pore space and the water that was originally there. Okay? One thing that I was stressing on before, that all these forces after the migration are stabilized. That is stabilization, we call it equilibrium. So all the forces are in equilibrium with each other, okay? If they are not in equilibrium, the rising will keep going and going and going, okay? So they have to be in equilibrium. We'll talk about the equilibrium in a second, right? I, sometimes I heard people talking about homogeneous. There is nothing called homogeneous distribution in the pore space, okay? Because the pore space itself is not homogeneous. Not the whole, the, the one pore space is different from the second one and the, the next one, which is the neighbor of the pore space. The two neighbors are not the same. They are not the same size. They are not the same structure. They are, they are completely different. If you take a piece of rock and you look under the microscope, I hope you guys can do that uh, sometime, you will see different pore sizes, different pore structures. It's absolutely irregular. So there is no homogeneity in our rocks but there is equilibrium in our rocks, okay? So the difference between homogeneous and equilibrium is a huge difference, okay? Equilibrium means forces are there and they actually came at equilibrium because they already now at rest, staying in the place where they are, right? Okay. How we determine the forces in our pore space, okay? All done in the laboratory. We don't calculate the, these things from logs or calculate these things from uh, uh, production data or any, any of that kind of stuff, no. We do these measurements in the lab, okay? We'll review this in a second because we, it's very important to know how we guys do this. It's very interesting and you see lots of ideas actually here. So we have adhesion forces and interfacial forces. You, you may ask, why did you skip the cohesion? We said the cohesion is between the same fluid. Okay, you can do this anywhere. Actually, it's even written, it's even uh, tabulated in, uh, in, uh, in physics books. So you don't have to measure this, okay? okay what's really in that you need to have is your fluid that's touching grains and your fluid that's touching each other, okay? So in this case, the adhesion forces and the interfacial forces are the two major forces that we measure. We don't measure cohesion forces, okay? To measure the adhesion forces, we use the first method called the plate method. Okay, we'll talk about the plate method, method in a second. The second method is the sessile method or the Cecil method. Cecil method is a second method that we use to measure adhesion forces. Right? For the cohesion forces, the pendant method. We use the pendant method to measure the cohesion forces. I'm sorry, the interfacial forces. Right? So for the adhesion forces, we have two methods. Very well known, the plate method and the uh, Cecil method. And also we have the interfacial forces that we measure with for the, with the pendant. We just talk about one method at a time, the plate method. What do you mean by a plate method? Here is the apparatus. It's a very simple thing. Plate method even comes by the name. I always tell you guys, the name is very important. Why do you call it the plate method? Because you actually cut 
a piece of your rock in the shape of a plate. You know what a plate is, you know? Uh, we'll, we'll show you the plate in a second, okay? So that's why you call it the plate method. So the plate method is cutting a piece of rock in the form of a plate, all right? Okay, and you see right here, there is a place that you can see that, that little piece here, I'll, I'll, I'll magnify it later. This piece is what the plate is all about. So this is the plate, this is the piece of rock that you cut and you actually hang it in here in a, in a, in a rod. This rod is controlled by this, by this uh, automatic control right here. It's not really a remote control, it's just a wired control. So the first of all, here is the piece of rock in the form of a plate. And you control this by this, this, this not a remote control, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's a wired control. You control the movement of the rod up and down, okay? In this piece of uh, tube here, we put a fluid. So the whole idea is put a fluid in the tube here and try to put the, to, to, to download your, your, your plate and you're trying to touch the fluid and see what, thing, what other things will, will happen and how to calculate the, the, uh, the, the adhesion force, okay? Right? So the whole idea is a rod that you can control in very precisely, the movement of the rod, you can control it very precisely to control the touching of this plate with the fluid because the adhesion forces is a force between rock and fluid, okay? All right. So once you do this, this is your fluid right here. Then when you, you lower, this is, your, this is what we call a plate. This is the shape that we call it a plate. It's a very thin layer, okay, intact together. Very thin layer that you, this is the rod that you control by this wired control. So to, you control the movement, very, very precise movement. All you need to have is this piece of rod touching your grain, uh, touching your fluid, because the adhesion forces is a rock with a fluid, right? Here is, the, uh, here, is, here is the right way to do it. It has to be perpendicular to, to the fluid. As you can see, it is very perpendicular to the surface of the fluid, right? This one is not perpendicular, so this is not the right way to measure. This one is actually has a uh, curvature, so it's not the right way of, of measuring. Should not be curvature, should not, should, should not take an angle. It has to be perpendicular on the surface, okay? Once you do this, so this is your plate right here. Here is your fluid. Once your plate will touch the fluid, you will see the forces now. You will see the adhesion forces, okay? That will create an angle between the, between the this is the shape of the fluid when it start to climb your plate. That climbing of your fluid on the plate is caused by the adhesion forces. So the adhesion force is the force that allows this fluid to climb into your plate and creates an angle. This angle is, this is your uh, uh, theta C, uh, this is the contact angle. C stands for contact. So the contact angle is the angle between the curvature of the fluid due to climbing into the surface and the surface of the, uh, and the, and the edge of your surface. So this angle is your contact angle. If you look at this from that side here, here is the curvature, okay? Here is the tangent to the curvature. Here is the perpendicular line. Here is the phi critical, or this is the critical angle that actually measures the adhesion forces. So we measure the adhesion forces of how small or how big this angle. In fact, we use the cosine angle instead of the angle, okay? So, but that's, that's something that goes back to the reservoir engineering. We actually calculate cosine theta as an indication of the, uh, the uh, adhesion force, okay? Which we call it later on in, in uh, a reservoir engineering, we call it wettability. So wettability means the fluid that's wetting my rock, because this fluid will wet my rock. That wetting actually creates this angle, and the cosine theta describes the wettability or the ability of this fluid to wet your rock, okay? So the, this, is, this is the plate force. If you look at the equation, here is the equation. Here is the, the surface tension, which is the, the adhesion force. It's the force over length. Here is the contact angle. Knowing all these parameters, you can actually calculate the contact angle or you measure the contact angle, okay? 
So this method we call the plate method because we use a plate to measure the contact angle between a fluid and myra. The second method we call the Cecil method. Cecil method is an apparatus developed by this guy, Cecil. Okay, so an apparatus that's developed to measure the contact angle between the surface and, and the fluid. It's a very interesting thing. Look at this. Here is the apparatus. The guy came up with a very brilliant idea, quite frankly. What he did is, here is the, uh, 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 you put your, your fluid in here, and fluid will come from a very small tube. I'm sure you guys can see that clearly on the screen or not. Here's a very tiny tube, okay? And, and you can see here is a camera. The tube, you put your, you put your, your uh, surface in here, you put your, uh, your rock in here, and you drop a, just a drop of your fluid on the rock, okay? So a drop of the fluid will go on your piece of rock right here. It will spread out, and you take a, take a picture of that, that shape of the drop that you put on your, on your, on, on your rock. And you take a picture of this, from the picture, you can actually easily, easily calculate the angle. I'll show you how we, how we do that, okay? So you guys can see that. So this is a drop that comes from where? It comes from this very tiny tube, because you need a very, very small drop, okay? And it comes from a very tiny tube. The drop drops here and spreads on, on the surface, okay? So if you look at the drop, the, 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 the drop, it goes, if you go backward here, you can see the movement. The, the drop can, will actually move and spreads on the surface. That surface has to be what? Has to be your rock, okay? So because you need to know what is the contact angle between this fluid and that piece of rock, okay? Then you take a picture of this. If you look at the picture that you take, here is the, here is the drop, here is the surface that you have. So if you look at the drop here, it's easy to, do, to draw a tangent and you measure the angle. It's very straightforward. Okay, so that's why many people use this method because it's a very, very straightforward method. You don't have to drop a plate like the plate method. You don't have to drop a plate. Be uh, careful when you look at the angle. Make sure you touch it. It's, it's, a lot of, so it's a lot of work to do, but this one is a very, very straightforward one. You just drop the drop on the surface and take a picture. Okay, from this picture, you can see the shape and you can see that the shape is, is actually here touching uh, that for sure has to be an oil, an oil drop to take that shape. Water drop will be completely different. So this is an oil drop here. And if you look at it, you just make a tangent in there and you measure the angle between your tangent and the surface and you get the cosine of that angle that gives you the contact angle. And the cosine of the angle will give you what we call the wettability is all about. Okay? So that's how to measure the adhesion forces. Two different ways. The plate method, if you don't have enough money to measure this apparatus, then the plate method is your method. If your school or your company has a, you know, money to spend on, measure, on, uh, on buying this, uh, this equipment, that would be a straightforward way of, of, of looking at the, at the uh, addition force. Okay? Second is the interfacial forces. So interfacial forces is different. It's fluid in a fluid. Everybody understand that. Adhesion, fluid, and surface. Okay, interfacial, fluid, and fluid. Pendant actually did a very, very interesting idea. Okay, what he did is, he said, okay, if I actually get a flask, okay, this flask, I will put the first liquid in the flask. All right, everybody understand that? So I put the first liquid in the flask. Then I will drop the second liquid. So this is the second liquid, I give it a color red. And I will drop the second liquid inside my first liquid. So the interfacial forces will take place. But because there is a pressure here, okay, let me see here. This one. Because there is a pressure here, the pressure of the grains of, of the, uh, the first liquid, that shape, if it's spherical, I just put it as spherical here just to give you an idea of, uh, of how things will change. If it's spherical here, it's not going to be a spherical there. Why? Because there is a pressure that comes from the, the first liquid on the drop of the second liquid. Okay? So, for example, if I drop this, then it will change shape. As you can see right there, the shape has to change. Why? 
because there is a pressure from outside and it will affect the pressure on inside. So you have a P1 and P2. So you have a delta P, two different pressures, one coming from the outside of the of fluid and the second one will be the inside. How can, how can we simulate this in our reservoir? Originally, that blue one is your water in the pore space. Then the oil comes in. When the oil comes in, it will come like drops, okay? These drops will actually get affected by the pressure inside your pore space, and that will actually go and affect the shape of the drops of the hydrocarbon in your pore space, okay? And that's because of the interfacial forces between them, right? Then he did the same thing that, the, that, that uh, Cecil did. What he did, he actually brought a camera and tried to, to, to take a picture of the new drop, the new shape of that drop, all right? The new shape of the drop will be this way. You will have two different radii. Space. Originally, it was a sphere. So R1 and R2 are the same before it gets dropped. After it gets dropped, then it, the shape will change. It will be like American football, if you guys know what American football is. It's an oval shape, okay? The oval shape would be R1 and R2. So you have two different R's. Okay? Now, if you use the equation, and I'll talk about, talk about this equation and who actually developed this equation. The equation is delta P, which is the pressure P1 minus P2, actually is proportional to 1 over R1 and 1 over R2. And the proportionality factor gamma is the interfacial force. So gamma is the interfacial force. You know your R1, you know your R2, by taking a picture of your new shape of the drop. So R1 and R2 are known. Delta P is known because you have a pressure in and out. You can measure the difference in pressure. You can actually have delta P. Then you can calculate gamma. Gamma is the interfacial force, okay? This equation is very well known. It's called Laplace interfacial equation, okay? Actually, they call it Laplace capillarity equation, but I will just, uh, uh, I'll call it interfacial for now until we talk about the capillarity, okay? So Laplace interfacial equation is very straightforward. It said the Laplace found, found out that the effect of the difference in pressure is actually deforming, deforming your your droplet from being spherical to an oval shape with different R1 and R2. You can actually look at R1 as a as a major and minor uh, radii in, in the in the ellipse. So you have R1 and R2. You know the delta P, you can actually look at R1 and R2 from the image that you take from the picture. Then you can calculate gamma. Again, it's a very, very straightforward to calculate the interpretation. Okay, right. Here is it's essentially what, what you do. Here is the drop. You see that the picture of the drop here? So he, they, they put the drop. He, they actually took a picture of it. And it comes on the screen. Here is the picture. You can actually measure easily the, the uh, R1 and R2. You plug it in this equation. You know, you measure the delta P by your apparatus, then you can calculate uh, the interpretation. Okay, right? So it's very straightforward how we do this in the lab. It's, it's things that we do all the time when we calculate, when we measure the, uh, the uh, wettability or the uh, adhesion forces, and we measure the interpretation forces, right? Okay. Any question, uh, Engineer Nihal, on, on this? Everybody is okay with that? Yeah, I guess so. Nobody has any comments? Not in the chat box, no, because I asked them if they have comments to be in the Excellent. chat box and Q&A and the Q&A part. Excellent. Are they, are they asleep or still, still awake? Now they're still awake. We have one question. How to measure the delta P? Delta P is just a, it's a pressure. You actually measure the pressure before the drop and the pressure after the drop. It's very straightforward. Okay. Just, you have a pressure sensor, huh? right? Uh, okay. Right. okay. Now, let's just talk about the capillary pressure. Well, I call the, the, the entry pressure, I, when, 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 remember when I call the entry pressure and I gave you an example of a door, a closed door. A closed door, when you or to try to get in a room, and that's exactly what happens in... in uh, in our reservoir. Hydrocarbon is trying to get into the room. Which room that we're talking about? The pore. So the room to the hydrocarbon is the pore. So it has to open the door. What is the door? The forces between the hydrocarbon and, and the water that was existing in there. Okay? And I, I give an example of this, a closed door. 
when you actually open the door, you exert certain type of force, certain type of pressure. But that when you open the door, that doesn't mean that you are in the room yet. No, you just open the door. So you use a certain force. You use a certain force just to let you in, but you are not in yet. You have to open, you have to break the barrier. The door is closed, you have to break the barrier, which is the door. Just open it with a certain force. This force is wasted, and it's not allowing you in. It's just breaking the barrier, okay? Then you have to have another force to get in. That's what we call entry pressure. I like to call it entry pressure because I like to, uh, to see, to, to, uh, to put things in, in a proper way. Okay, so many actually in the industry, they call it entry pressure, by the way. It's not, it's not something I developed. I like the word entry pressure because it does have a meaning. Okay? Some, they call it the displacement pressure. Displacement means it's the time that you will displace the water. You, you displace it means you, take it, you get the water out and you get in. So that's why they call it displacement pressure. This is the start of the displacement pressure. Okay? Right. Some, they call it threshold. Threshold means after that, this is threshold means the limit. After that limit, you will be able to get in. So all, they all have the same meaning, right? So entry pressure, displacement pressure, threshold pressure, they all have the meaning. The people in academia, they like to call it threshold because they like to use this type of words. In industry, we don't like this type of words, okay? We like to look at things like a displacement, oil is displacing water, or entry, oil is entering the poor space. That's, that's how things are in the industry. Threshold is the limit, okay? It means after that you'll be able to get in, but that's a very highly academic way of looking at or, or naming type of question. It's not a wrong name. It's just not the name that we use in the industry, okay? You may see the threshold pressure in textbooks sometimes, but the actually, actually some many textbooks they use also the word displacement and the word entry, okay? Second is capillary pressure is simply, please never forget this. Capillary pressure is simply movement against gravity. That's what the capillarity is all about. Capillary means you are moving against gravity. Gravity pushes you down. Does my hydrocarbon go down or go up? My hydrocarbon goes up. So my hydrocarbon goes up against gravity. That's what the capillarity is all about. Okay, so capillary pressure is simply moving against gravity. Keep it that way in your mind. When you move against gravity, it's a capillarity. Okay, everybody understand that. Now, our, when, when I look at my, my reservoir, my hydrocarbon is moving up. My gravity is pulling me down. Am I moving with gravity or against gravity? I'm moving against gravity. That's why we call this curve capillary pressure. It represents capillarity. Capillarity in physics means you're moving against gravity. So everybody understand what capillarity is, okay? okay. Second, why we call it capillary? Okay, why do we call it? Remember, always ask why. Why even, why even call it that name? Okay. The word capillary comes from a, from a Latin word. It's called capillaris. Capillaris means very tiny hair. You know your hair? Your hair looks look like a tube. Okay, so the hair is look like, looks like a tube and it's very tiny. So the capillaris is a tiny hair in Greek. And that's why it means your hydrocarbon, your fluid is moving in a very tiny tube. The tube that takes the shape of the hair. Okay, especially if it's a curly hair because it's irregular. Okay, doesn't have to be a straight hair. Okay, I always call it, say, say that in, in the classes. Curly hair is actually what represents reality. We don't have straight hairs in our rocks, okay? We have hair tubes for sure, which is the poor throat, but that's curly type hair, okay? Because it's irregular in shape. So that's why we call it capillarity. So capillary comes from the Latin word capillaris, which meaning tiny as hair, okay? So it's tiny hair, it's called the capillary. Actually, they got it for the, uh, it came for, for the wigs when they started using wigs in the, in the Roman time and the Greek time, okay? So capillarity means very tiny, like hair, okay? All right. 
So it's simply like the rise of fluids in a very tiny tube. So that's why we call it capillaries. It's similar to rising in a very tiny tube, like hair type size tube. Okay? So that's when the capillarity comes up clearly. All right? Are, are we okay now in the naming? Okay, everybody knows why we call it capillary. It's very important to know that type of stuff. Right? Let's just study the capillary tube a little bit more. Now, let's just have, like I say, a, a glass, and we put water in this glass. Okay, so I have glass. Okay, what is with my mouse? Okay, I have glass, and the glass has water in here, and actually just but just take it air for the time being. Okay, so I have glass, water, and air. Right. Now, if I, bring, if I bring a capillary tube, it means a tube that has very small radius, okay? That's why we call it capillary. It has to be very small radius. So if I go, if I put this tube with a very small radius, I'm making big here just for you guys to see, what will happen? What will happen is this is air and this is water, two different fluids, okay? Then the water will climb up. And you will see that type of structure here. The water will climb up, pushing the air up. Is the water going with gravity or against gravity? It's going against gravity. Once it's going against gravity, that's because of the capillarity. Okay? Is it clear? So this one is going against gravity. Okay? Now, here is air. This is air and this is water. Are these two different phases or the same phases? It's two different phases. When you have two different phases, what happens? An interfacial force comes up. Always, if you have two different phases, this is air and this is water, two different phases, then a, 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 a interfacial force will come up. Here is the interfacial force. Interfacial force sigma is between your air and your water. And it makes an angle, okay, if you see that, makes an angle with the surface. This is what? This is your contact angle. Okay? So this is where for you, that will actually relate to your wettability. Remember when we measure the contact angle and we measure the interfacial forces. They are the two forces. We don't measure the uh, cohesion forces. Okay? So we have the interfacial forces and we have the angle, which is the contact angle. All right? Everybody understand that? Okay. This is the interfacial forces. Now, Let's just do some mathematics here. I don't like mathematics much anyway, but uh, for, for the presentations, but uh, let's, uh, I have to do that for, to, for the sake of showing you what's really going on. Look at this, this force, okay? I can get a projection of the force in the direction of the tube and a projection of the force perpendicular to the tube. Any force can be directed in the, in the, direction, in the, in the upper direction and with a 90 degree, okay? So, if I need to get the projection in the direction of the tube, so the force will be pulling me where? Pulling me up. Look at, look at this. Force will pulling me up. And the value will be sigma cosine P. So the value will be sigma cosine P. Sigma between water and air. That's why we call it WA. Sigma water air cosine the angle theta. Is it clear? And it's pulling me up. So for my water to climb up, okay, this force has to be stronger than, than the gravitational force. That's why. So there is a force here that was created by the capillarity that actually overcomes the pulling down from the Earth. Earth is pulling you down by gravity. The, uh, the interfacial force is pulling you up by the, by the forces. If the interfacial forces is higher then the gravitational forces, then you're climbing up. This is the only way. And that's exactly what happens. That's why sometimes we call density, we call it gravity. If you actually go on some of the reservoir engineering books, we call density gravity. Why? Because that describes the change of gravity on it. Okay? It's affected by gravity. Right? Okay. So my, my sigma is here. Is this, is this force acting on this point or on the perimeter, on the circumference, okay, of my tube? It actually is looking at, uh, affecting my circumference of the tube because the whole fluid is climbing up. So it actually goes around the tube. So it's not a single force at a single point. 
it's the force multiplied by by the perimeter what is the perimeter of your tube if you have a radius r it's 2 pi r then my total force is sigma water air cosine theta multiplied by 2 pi r okay so this is the total force up at the same time you have forces full pulling you down okay the force that pulls me down is mg we all take this in mechanics okay mass times gravity mg is the forces that pulls you down okay what is mass mass is density times volume okay so i can actually write this as density times volume i know the density because i know my water correct so i know my density so i know the density what is the volume well if i have this h and i have the area okay area times height gives me the volume of the water above the surface correct if the water is climbing for an h h times the area area of a circle is what pi r squared so pi r squared times h gives me the volume then i can say rho times pi r squared h times g this is the forces down everybody understand that so i have two forces one is pulling me up which is the interfacial forces i have one pulling me down which is the gravitational forces the the one that is higher it will take the, the control if the interfacial forces is higher than the gravitational forces my hydrocarbon will climb up okay if the other way around my hydrocarbon will go down but in fact the, the interfacial forces always higher than the gravitational forces okay now Force down is known. Why? Why you put it this, uh, rho, rho as rho water minus rho air? Because actually, there are the difference between the two. Because this one has a weight. Okay, air doesn't have really much weight, but, but rho air is very, very negligible. Okay? When we reach something very important, we call it after equilibrium. What equilibrium means? When the two forces are equal. Let's remember our fluids and our pores are at equilibrium not homogeneous the all the forces has to change affect each other until they reach equilibrium equilibrium means they are equal now everything is a steady state no more movement all right okay so at equilibrium the two forces are equal when you put the two forces are equal you get this equation okay but that's not reality uh, we don't have air in our reservoir what do we have in our reservoir water and oil it's just go for reality here oil and water so instead of, of having air here we have oil and here we have water so the struggle between what between oil and water then we can write the equation similar and instead of having oil water and air we have water and oil it's very simple it's the same equation that you studied in elementary school actually it's the same equation but in this case we have the two flows that we have, which is water and oil. And in this case, what's my interfacial force? It's between water and oil. Previously, it's been water and air. Here, it's between water and oil. We just change the, uh, the notation here. Sigma water oil and rho water and rho oil. Everybody understand that? Okay. If you do your math right there, keep going, you can calculate H. So I can calculate H from knowing all these parameters. What is my contact angle? Just look at this. What is phi is my contact angle. That's why we measure the contact angle. Everybody understand that now? That's why we measure the contact angle. So you need to measure the contact angle to calculate the cosine theta. I need to measure what? The interfacial forces. Sigma water oil is the interfacial forces. I know my water density. I know my oil density. Just, just take a sample of oil. You know my old you know you know the pore sizes okay by looking under the microscope in your in, in your rock you know the gravity then the capillarity is very well known. i know how far my hydrocarbon will migrate in my reservoir okay so that's what is the relationship between the height and the capillarity so the word capillarity guys take it that way capillarity means moving against gravity yeah, it, it keeps moving again its gravity until the equilibrium takes place. So when the equilibrium takes place, then you take a look at the equation and you can calculate 
how far my hydrocarbon migrated. And that's why in the capillary pressure, we look at the pressure and we change the pressure to height because between the pressure and the height is a very strong relation. Okay, got it? So now here is my pressure. My pressure is known and that because it goes again, is here, here, here is the, the pressure and, and height are similar. Okay. When you go up, the pressure decreases, right? Okay. So, so I can actually take this and I calculate at any pressure, I can calculate where is my height. That's why we like to know our reservoir pressure at every single point, which call it the pressure gradient. Pressure gradient is the change of the pressure as a function of depth. Why I need to know that? Because I need to know the pressure at this depth to know if I have hydrocarbon or not. Why? Because I can calculate the height according to that pressure. If this height is very close to the capillary height or very far from the capillary height. If it's very far from the capillary height, this zone will never have any hydrocarbon. It's within the capillary height, then this zone will be saturated with hydrocarbon. That's the importance of the capillary pressure. Any question on this? Engineer Nihal, anybody has any comments? Anybody sitting there not even no. understanding anything? Yeah, no, uh, we have, we have, someone is asking, is this called Henry Law? What's Henry Law? I, I don't think, uh, I, don't, um, I don't think I don't it's. Understand. I don't know what does it mean. Okay, YH from 0.2 to 0.4, not from 0.2 uh, until the bottom of the container. Is in gravity affect the whole column of water? What what's 0.2 and 0.4? Uh, say, say the question again. YH is from 0.2 to 0.4, not what from 0.2. What's point I'm not sure what, what what slide is this. You guys, if you uh, have, have a question what, about what a is, slide, what is the 0.2? What is 0.2? I didn't put a point two here in, anywhere. I think, yeah, you no, know, go back, go back to the other one. The one that had to the front of the capillary, I guess. There is one, two, four. CH. One, two, four. Yeah, one, two, and four. Oh, this, no, no, no. These are just and points of showing the surface. The, uh, this is between, uh, the, the point two to four is the length, the point three is the concave. So this means you don't measure all the way down to you just measure at to at point, point four. This is what it means. It's above the surface. Okay. It's just an illustration for the uh, instead of saying oh go up to this point from two to four. This is the maximum. Why the, why two? Because remember this is the surface that you have. It's a concave surface. So it, this is the minimum point to to the surface that you have here, which is the straight line through. Okay. So two and four are displaced distances, but there's no meaning whatsoever, huh? Right? Oh, okay. okay. Uh, someone is asking, water is mostly termed as driving fluid or driving force, which tends to push the hydrocarbons to move above or move towards the drainage area, while the water no, is no, more... No, this is, no this, is, this is not a true statement. The, the whole thing is a struggle between the two fluids and the capillarity. Everything goes back to what type of fluid do you have. Uh, sometimes we call what type of water because also salinity of water is, 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 is another factor. Uh, the, the density of your hydrocarbon that you have in there. Uh, what is the size of your pore throat? So many factors that affect the motion of the hydrocarbon, okay? Okay, yeah. Right? Okay, so you can go on. Right. Okay, now we'll go for the second uh, group of, of, um, of questions, which is the high gamma ray reading. Okay, that was really very good uh, questions here. One of the questions saying, he has a type of rock, if gamma ray increased to 400 API at in many, at, at, at in more than one well. Actually, it has a field. The field actually shows gamma ray up to 400, okay? Yeah, that, sometimes that happens. Okay, I'll tell you why this is happening and how to overcome that type of, 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 uh, of issues, okay? Second is, which is a very interesting question, 
said high gamma ray on source rock because of organic material which contains uranium but why we cannot see high gamma ray in normal reservoir if it contain hydrocarbon where is the uranium gone okay all right guys okay let me let me let me let me finish the, the third one and we will we'll continue same questions somebody was uh, complaining about uh, nihal she's not really uh, asking the questions that they write so i'm just kidding with you okay so it's, it's not you so the question is he was asking the same question and he didn't find answer he's asking he's actually saying you have thorium potassium and uranium why uranium is only in conventional sand why we can see uranium in conventional sand and the kind of stuff okay okay <coughs> guys remember when we talked about hydrocarbon migrating, we're talking about fluid migration. There is no grains migration. There is no organic material migration. It's the organic material that actually changed to oil. Oil will migrate. The, the rest of whatever changed to hydrocarbon, the residual, including uranium will never migrate with the oil okay uranium is a residual that will stay within the source rock okay so don't ever think that the uranium will migrate what migrates is the fluid because it has lower density and it actually gets in contact with another fluid creating interfacial forces that will drive him to go up as we discussed in the capillaries nothing will this the, the 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 uranium are grains grains of uranium okay these are the, like a piece of rock right it's not a fluid it's not a fluid so it will never migrate don't ever think that the uranium will migrate with the hydrocarbon the uranium will stay with the residual part of your source rock after it creates or after it already cooked and generated your hydrocarbon am i clear in this never ever forget this uranium will never migrate okay i will i will stress on this in one of the slides but for clay zones in general we look at potassium and thorium potassium and thorium in clays potassium and thorium in clays all when we look when we talked about the clay mineral we said that all clays have potassium or thorium okay and they have this with different percentage the percent of potassium and thorium will represent will actually give me a, even an idea of identifying clay type because each clay type has a certain component of uh, thorium measured in part per million and a certain component of potassium measured in percent okay so the percent of potassium and the part per million of, of thorium will be used, as we discussed uh, previously, will be used to identify the clay type. So potassium and thorium are, are attached to clays. Right? Everybody understand that? Right. Now, what if my rock has a radioactive atom? Some rocks actually have potassium in there. That happens mainly in plastics. Okay, in our reservoirs, we have two different types of reservoirs. We have plastic reservoir and we have carbonate reservoirs. Plastic reservoirs are coarse sandstone. There are other things called orthoclase, and I will talk about this in a second because that's that's the issue here. Okay, and carbonates. Carbonates they will never have potassium in there. Okay. They will never have potassium in there. It's not, it's not similar to what happens in, in plastics. Okay? So in some rocks, gamma ray measures, uh, the gamma ray tool actually measures the gamma ray. Will, when you have rock that has potassium by nature, if your sandstone has potassium on its own, then the gamma ray tool will read it. Okay? That will create mistakes in calculating gamma ray. Okay? Happens in plastics reservoir, in sandstone. There are certain plastic type called orthoclase. Orthoclase has, your, has potassium in there. Okay? So orthoclase, by definition, by rock structure, it contains potassium. 
and that potassium is not related to clay, but the gamma ray will read it because potassium has high radioactivity. So the gamma ray will read it. That will give you a very high gamma ray. You need to correct for this. Okay? That's why in, in many cases, if you look at Schlumberger or Halliburton, they give you two types, different types of, 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 uh, of gamma ray. One is called SGR and the other is called CGR. SGR is a spectral gamma ray, all the gamma ray. CGR, the correct for potassium. Okay? So once you need to do this, you need to correct for potassium. If your potassium is actually changing on foot by foot, that sometimes happens also, makes your life even more complicated, okay? Then in this case, you actually are in a, in a very big problem. So you need to correct for the gamma ray. Service companies do this. They give you that correction. So they give you two curves, SGR and CGR. To calculate your, your, your clay volume, use the CGR, not the SGR. The SGR is everything. CGR is corrected for the potassium component of your rock, right? Okay. If they didn't do it, don't ever use this gamma ray for, for your clay volume calculation. This is wrong, right? So what if I, do, I cannot even correct for, which in many cases it happens, I cannot even correct my gamma ray for the potassium of the orthoclase, then there are some other methods. We use the neutron density to calculate clay volume. Okay? And I will, I'll, I will talk to Dr. Ahmed later on to probably uh, set up a, a, one of the webinars to, to, so, to, to talk about how to calculate clay volume from the neutron density because it requires some more uh, introduction of a few things to, to come up with how, how we do that. Now we calculate the clay volume from the neutron and the density. Okay? So one or two things. If the surface company corrected for the orthoclase or any other source of, uh, of potassium gamma ray, okay? okay, if they correct for it, that's good. You can use it. And they call it CGR. Don't ever use the SGR. Okay? You always actually, if you go and look at the SGR, and by, by the way, CGR and SGR come when you run spectral gamma ray, not the normal gamma ray. Okay? When you run the spectral gamma ray. Remember the spectral gamma ray? That differentiate between potassium, thorium, and uranium. If you, if you actually run the spectral gamma ray, then you allow the service company to do some corrections for you. One more thing that actually may, may, may cause your gamma ray to read very high, but it's not related to your rock. Okay? When you use KCL in your mud, okay? let's assume that you weight your mud with KCL. What's a KCL? It's a potassium chloride. Okay? So you have potassium in the pore space. Is it far away from the tool? It's very close to the tool. It's very close to the tool. So we actually see huge gamma ray reading because of the potassium in the pore space. So potassium is always a problem, either by being in the rock or by being in the mud. Okay? It depends because sometimes we drill with KCL if our, mud, uh, if our clay is unstable and we need to do some stability for, for, the, uh, for the clays that we have. Okay? So either clay can be in, I'm sorry, either potassium can be in your rock as an orthoclase, okay, or potassium-rich uh, sandstone, or <coughs> it can be in your mud when you add KCL as a mud additive in your uh, in your drill. Okay? So both cases, and if it happens to me, I tell you what I do. I always throw the gamma ray away. Okay, or I do two things: I calculate the clay volume using the gamma ray and also calculate clay volume using neutron density and compare, okay? If I'm satisfied that the company is corrected for potassium properly, then I go and use the, 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 the gamma ray. If I can see big difference between my calculated neutron density clay volume from my calculated gamma ray clay volume, then I will stick with the neutron density because that tells me that the service company did not do a good job in correcting for my uh, for the potassium coming from the rock or coming from from the mud. Okay, all right. Okay. Now, <laughs> the second question is: high gamma ray on source rock coming from uranium. Uranium, never ever do this. Okay, only fluids migrate. Please, don't ever think that uranium will migrate. Uranium will not migrate. 
Potassium and thorium are in your reservoir already because they are, are part of the clay in the reservoir. So your potassium and thorium does not move with your hydrocarbon. It's in your rock already. It's part of your clay composition. Okay? Uranium actually is in the source rock, but it does not migrate with your flow. Don't ever think that uranium will migrate in your flow. In some cases, we see uranium in some rock. You see that in carbonate. See, you see potassium in, in plastics. You see uranium in carbonate because we'll talk about this because carbonate deposition is what's called precipitation and that's a different issue. We'll talk about it in a second. Okay? All right? Everybody understand that? So what we, what we look at here, these two questions are misunderstood what uranium is. Uranium is a residual part in your source rock and will stay in your source rock. That's why when we go and log the source rock, we see uranium very high because even if it's residual, it will stay there in the source rock, indicating residual uranium. Okay? But uranium will never migrate with your hydrocarbon. Okay? Migration against gravity happens only in fluid. Okay? No migration of uranium, not a fluid. It's part of the organic material. Organic material does not travel. Everybody understand that? Clear? Am I clear on this point? Anybody, uh, Nihal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Nihal, is anybody has still any confusion on this? Mm, don't think so. Nothing in the comment section. Okay. Everybody's um, awake anyway. Just make sure that everybody's awake. Just we have, we have one question. Is clay conductive or resist resistive? <laughs> I discussed discuss that in the formation evaluation. Clay, clay composition, if you look at the clay, it has metallic components and it has water in there, okay? So all clays contain metallic components, like what? Like aluminum, okay? Like sodium, like magnesium, okay? All of these are metallic components. If you have any metallic component in any rock, what the metallic component will do? It will allow current to get in. It will allow current to pass. When you allow current to pass, what will happen to your, your resistivity? It will read low when the current is passing. When the resistivity reads high, when the current is not passing. Okay? All right. So because of the water components in the clays and because of the metallic component of the clays, clays are very conductive. That's why if you look at the resistivity in front of your clay, Zone, it will read lower. It will read low because it's conductive. Right? Clear? Yeah, that's fine. That's it? Yes. Now to... Go, go ahead. Okay. Now to the big question, the negative process that everybody's talking about here. What is the negative porosity here? Okay. Uh, Nihal, I want to make sure everybody is awake because this is this is the big thing, all right? Everybody okay, awake. if you're awake, if you're awake, you guys say yes in the <laughs> chat box. <laughs> all right. All right. What's the negative porosity in this case? Negative porosity is a question that I threw uh, to you guys and ask you to come up with uh, some kind of explanation. I really liked your explanation. It's better than my class's explanations in many ways because I sometimes I hear some uh, very weird explanation. I will never say it's bad explanation. No, no. I can say it's weird a little bit, but it's not bad. Nothing, nothing is called bad thinking. Okay? The, the thinking that's bad is not thinking at all. That's what the bad thinking is. It's not even thinking. By thinking mistakenly, it's okay. But, you know, don't, don't be too weird in your thinking, okay? Because being weird in the thinking, that's, that's something that probably will make people a little bit uh, worried about the way you understand things, okay? So what's the negative porosity scale? I have so many questions. If you can go and, uh, and find what's the negative 15 and negative 15 and So we have uh, multiple questions on this, okay? Let me start with this. Let me start with the triple combo. You guys understand what the triple combo is, okay? What is a triple combo? We talked about this, that you run neutron as one, density, number two, resistivity is number three. That's why we call it triple 
How about the gamma ray? Gamma ray, we don't count it. We all talked about this before. We don't count the gamma. Gamma ray is a must have anyway. Okay? You always go in any well bore with a gamma ray. If, even if you go and do perforation, you go with the gamma ray. Gamma ray, we use it not mainly for clay. We use it for clay for sure, but also for depth matching. Okay? When you look at depth and try to perforate in a certain, a certain zone, so gamma ray is a must have anyway. So nobody counts the gamma ray. Gamma ray is always there. We love it. Okay, so it's a tool that we don't count it. Okay, so the triple combo goes for neutron, density, and resistance. Okay, okay, all right. Then we actually plot the triple combo. Here is the triple combo. Okay, we put the gamma ray in the first track, we put the resistivity in the second track, we put the neutron density in the third track. Oh, you have to ask a question. Gamma ray on a separate track. Okay. Resistivity on a separate track. Neutron density are on the same track. Everybody, everybody is following me. Then that requires why. Every time you see something that's inconsistent, ask why. Why are we doing this? Okay. Everybody understand that now. I saw people putting, or the API, the American Petroleum Institute, who controls all these type of things. The American Petroleum Institute, API, asked us to put the gamma ray in a track. It puts the resistivity in another track, separate. And it puts the neutron and the density on the same track. Okay? So that requires why API is doing this. It's very important to know. Okay? Everybody understand that? Okay. What does the neutron tool actually measure? It measures porosity. Everybody understand that? What's the density tool measure? It measures density. It does not measure porosity. Does the density tool measure porosity? No. It does not. It measures density. Remember, the neutron tool measures porosity based on what? Based on trying to find out how much hydrogen you have. You send neutrons, which will hit hydrogen. If it hits hydrogen, it will die. Clear? And the less number of neutrons coming back to you, the more hydrogen you have in the rock, the higher the porosity. Very simple. We talked about this before. The more, uh, more neutrons come, coming back to you means less hydrogen because they didn't die, means low porosity. Hydrogen is a direct relationship to porosity. Never, ever forget this, okay? Am I clear? Never, ever forget that neutron tool measures hydrogen. To know how the neutron tool will respond to anything, look at this anything and look at it. Does it have hydrogen or not? If it has hydrogen, neutron tool will show it as porosity. If it doesn't have hydrogen, neutron tool has to read zero. No question. Am I clear? Because the neutron tool, by, by design, it actually looks for hydrogen. Okay? What's the density tool? Density tool does not look for hydrogen. The density tool looks for what? It, it's actually affected by the number of electrons. Remember when we talked about the density tool? It looks at the number of electrons. Why? Because number of electrons equals to the number of, of protons, okay? Number of protons equals to the number of neutrons. Number of protons and neutrons is responsible for the weight. Weight is real, it has a relationship with density, and that's why the density tool measures electrons. Everybody understand these two concepts? We cover this in details later. Uh, I'm sorry, before. We cover them before in the, in the formation of all, all the wood logging uh, webinar, okay? Right? So if this one measures porosity direct, which is the neutron. The second one does not measure porosity, it measures density, okay? Okay, everyone understand that? Why we combine them both on the same track? They should be on separate track, unless there is a good reason, okay? okay. Well, let's look at the density. Let's have a piece of rock. I have a piece of rock in there. That piece of rock has two components, major components, pore, porosity, and matrix rock so the porosity is inside the rock if the porosity has a volume of phi 
and the fluid there that lives there is raw fluid, density of fluid. The rest of the piece of rock, if this is phi, the rest of the piece of rock will be one minus phi. Simple. And the matrix will be row matrix. So I have two pieces here that makes my rock. Matrix and pores. Pore has a certain volume. We we'll call it phi. And the, what the, the thing that resides in there is my fluid. We we'll call it row fluid. My rock has the rest of the volume. One minus phi. And its matrix density is row matrix. So it's easy to write what we call the total matrix or in, in, in our uh, index, we call it bulk density. Bulk is the total thing. Yeah? Okay. So the bulk density or the total density is porosity times the roof load, that volume times the roof load, plus the volume of the rock times the row matrix. It's very simple. Uh, now, I can actually manipulate this equation. You just manipulate this equation. If you manipulate the equation, one times phi matrix, does it have porosity? It's no, it's only phi matrix. I will take it, put it on the other side. So I will take this one times row matrix and put the other side, it will be row bulk minus row matrix equals to phi times row fluid plus, oh, I'm sorry, minus phi times row matrix. Then I can factor out the porosity. So here you can factor out porosity to be row fluid minus row matrix. Then I can calculate porosity. We call this density porosity. That's why the API said you can calculate den porosity from density, then you can put both on the same track. Everybody understand that? So that because from the density, I can calculate porosity, then I can put the density and the neutron on the same track. Can you calculate porosity from gamma ray? No. So that cannot be on the same track with the neutron density. Can you calculate porosity from the resistivity? No. That's why you should, it should be on, uh, on, on a, uh, uh, a separate track by, on its own. So that's why, that's why you put that kind, of the, that kind of separation. Why do you put the density and the porosity on the same track? Because porosity measures porosity direct. And density, you can calculate density from porosity. Am I clear on this? Okay, so that actually answers the first question. Why the API is putting the neutral and the density on the same track? Everybody agrees, okay? So, and let me go back here and, and just remind you, porosity is row bulk minus row matrix divided by roof load minus row matrix, okay? Fine. So the answer to this question, because both are used to calculate porosity. One of them is measuring porosity direct, and it gives me my porosity. Second will allow me to calculate porosity. We call it density porosity. Everybody clear on this? That's why the API recommending both on the same track. Clear? Okay. Now, okay, what, what, what am I doing here? Okay. Then, if they are on the same track, they should be consistent. What do you mean by consistent? Okay, so understand this. You put the two of them on the same track. Say so there should be consistency. What's a consistency? Consistency on the scale. Not, not two different scales. Things will be absolutely irregular. We will be confused. Okay? The scales have to be consistent. Everybody understand that? So to put, yes, we understood now that I can. One of them measures porosity. And the other one calculates porosity. Everybody make this different, uh, difference clear in your mind. The neutron porosity measures neut porosity direct by measuring how much hydrogen do you have. Density does not measure porosity direct. You can calculate porosity out of the density. Am I clear on this? Now, we put them on the same scale. This scale on the same track then the scale has to be consistent. Let's just explain what, explain what consistency means. Consistent means use the same scale. What do you mean use the same scale? One by one. Neutron. Actually, if you look at the neutron, how many scales on the neutron? We have three scales. One is called limestone scale, sandstone scale, dolomite scale. 
Some people actually confuse this because the scale is because of the difference in density. That's not absolutely correct. This is absolutely incorrect. Limestone, sandstone, and dolomite scales are not because they are different in density, guys. That's not true. Okay? That's not true at all. It has nothing to do with the density. Neutron only, only responds to hitting atoms. When it hits hydrogen, it dies. When it hits any other thing, it doesn't die, but it loses some energy. Okay? Okay, let me let's just take it one by, step by step. Everybody is, is, is okay with this. If you guys have any comment, just write it down and, and Nihal will stop me, okay? Okay, I, I, it's, everything is clear now. Neutron porosity has three scales. Limestone, sandstone, and dolomite. And actually, you're all familiar with this type of, of chart. You have limestone scale, you have sandstone scale, you have dolomite scale, okay? Let's just go deeper a little bit to understand this. It's, it's important to understand that. Why? Why is because, actually, this is the equation that we use for the neutron, remember? This is the equation we use for the neutron. We said E final is related to E initial by the atomic mass that it hits. When it hits hydrogen, what's the, what's the atomic mass of hydrogen? One. One minus one is zero. That's why when it hits hydrogen, it dies. So hydrogen is the most effective. If I send a thousand neutrons and I get back only 10, this means 990 died already because I have 990 atom of hydrogen. Okay? Clear. Okay. So this is my equation. E final equals A2 minus A1 minus 1 over A2 plus 1. What is A2? Any atom. Hydrogen is one of the atoms. Okay? What is sandstone? Everybody just please concentrate on this. What is sandstone? It's silicon dioxide. <laughs> What if the neutron actually hits, what, hits silicon? Okay, silicon dioxide doesn't have any hydrogen in there. It's IO2, there is no hydrogen. So let's assume it will hit silicon. Okay, what is the atomic mass of silicon? It's actually 28. Let's just take the 28 and plug it in this equation. I will find the final energy. When it hits the atom, which is called silicon. <clears throat> okay. So E final equals 28 minus 1 over 28 plus 1. Everybody agrees to this. You do the math, it's 27 over 29. You do the math, then the E final is 93% of the E initial. When it hits what? When it hits silicon. Clear? When it hits a hydrogen, it dies completely. But when it hits silicon, it actually loses 7% of its energy. Okay, clear. <coughs> okay. Now, what will happen if it goes, if we are running it in limestone? What's limestone? It's calcium carbonate. Let's take the calcium. What if the neutron hits the calcium? Okay, then we need to know what is the atomic mass number or uh, the atomic mass weight or uh, the atomic mass number of, of the atom, of the calcium is 40. Remember, 40. Put a 40 here, then E final equals 40 minus 1 over 40 plus 1 E initial. What happens to the energy? It became 0 0.95. It's different than, than who? Than hitting silicon. That's the reason for the scale. Nothing to do with being heavy or being light. It's being the composition, the chemical composition. When the neutron goes into sandstone formation, it will never see calcium. When the neutron goes to the carbonate formation, it will never see silicon. Everybody understand that? That's why. So the differences in these scales, not because of the density of each element. It's because of the chemical composition of each element, because of the scattering capability of each element, because of the weight of atomic mass number of each element is not the weight, it's the atomic mass number. Everybody understand that? The hitting property, the losing of energy. Everybody clear on this? So the reason for the scales, sandstone, limestone, and dolomite, not because of the weight, guys. Never. I will prove that to you in a second. Not because of the weight. 
It's because of what? It's because of the difference in the chemical composition of the rock. Clear? Okay. Therefore, the neutrons movements in sandstone is different from the, move, the movement in limestone and dolomite. Exactly. This is why we have three scales for the three different lithologies. <coughs> Not because they are different in density. I'm repeating myself over and over. Not because they are different in density. They are different in chemical composition. Okay? Right. We need to choose one of them. Uh, we have now we know we have three different scales because the neutron has different strengths of losing energy based on which element is, is hitting. So we need to standardize the scale. What is the standard scale? We chose limestone. Okay. According to our sequence of webinars, can I say, oh, the API told me it's limestone. Should I stop or should I say what? Why did you do this? It's important to ask why. Why were you using this? Why would you, why would you even use the sandstone? <laughs> In fact, if you go to the US, they use the sandstone, but that's, that's very weird. It's, it's for a different reason. Okay? The standard API is the limestone. Why the limestone? Because it's very stable rock. Not, the, look, look, not like the sandstone. Sandstone will have what? Will have clays, will have orthoclase, will have potassium, will have so many strange things that makes it difficult to find a clean sandstone in any reservoir. Why I can assure you, you can have very nice clean limestone in many reservoirs. Okay, that's why we use the limestone as the standard. So very stable rock, very low clay content. Why very low clay content? Because they don't need cementing materials. Because they are actually de depositing in precipitation. The grains are precipitated in water. <laughs> and that's why the precipitation does not require. It's very, very fine grains precipitated and it's in contact with each other by precipitation, not by clay. We don't see much of clays in, in, in limestone. Okay? Clear? So that's why the choice is limestone. It's easier, more cleaner. It's more stable. It's even... <laughs> more spread out across the uh, across the reservoir so the limestone is the scale that the api chose my um is the, is the, is the line of thinking now is, is clear okay right. we didn't answer the negative prosty yet therefore the density scale has to be consistent with the neutron scale okay and we chose remember we chose the limestone scale we chose the limestone scale for the neutron, correct? Okay. The density prosty equation has to be modified. Remember, we derived the density prosty. Density prosty was, take, took a certain shape. This is the density prosty. Rho bulk minus rho matrix divided by rho fluid minus rho matrix. You have no right now to put rho matrix and you leave it unknown. No, it has to be known. If you will put the density on the same track of the neutron, neutron is on limestone, then you decided your matrix. is not unknown anymore. Your matrix is limestone. Density of limestone is 2.71. Then it has to be rho bulk minus 2.71 divided by rho fluid minus 2.71. I'm sorry, this should be, should be 2.71, okay? I have no idea what you want. So it would be rho, rho bulk minus 2.71 divided by rho fluid minus 2.71. Everybody understand that? Okay? So why I did this? Because I will put my density on the same track with my neutron. If my neutron is on limestone scale, my rho matrix has to be limestone matrix. It has to be 2.71. Am I clear? Everybody understand? So this is the first limitation. You have to change your density prosty from being a known matrix to being limestone matrix. Why? Because you're putting both on the same track. Right? Okay. Okay, keep, keep going. What are the major lithologies we have in nature? We have three major reservoirs. Correct? Right? What, are, what are these? Sandstone, 
limestone, dolomite. Now, if you work in carbonate rocks, it is a very important piece of rock that we call it a seal. That seal, when we see, <laughs> when we see anhydrite, that's good news, by the way, because there will be a reservoir down below. It doesn't have to be down below, that's direct, but you will see a reservoir down below. Why? Anhydrite doesn't have any porosity. So it's a seal, it doesn't have any permeability. Okay? It's a seal. It's a seal, so anhydrite is very important to us. So actually, we have four different lithologies. Three we produce from, and one is a seal. The sandstone, the limestone, the dolomite are our reservoirs. The anhydrite is a seal, and we need to know where is it. Okay? All right. What is the density of sandstone? 2.65. What's the limestone? 2.71. What's the dolomite? 2.87. What's the anhydrite? 2.98. Okay, that's the sequence of, of densities. Okay, everybody understand that? So these are the different densities. Great. We said consistency is a must. All right. What's the neutron process? <coughs> neutron process is always on limestone scale. We agreed on this. Clear? Density with the neutron in the same, same track, so density has to be on limestone scale for consistency. Okay, I'm just, I'm just uh, uh, summarizing it, okay? So it has to be on limestone scale for consistency, okay? This is why we use 2.71 for lithology, okay? I, 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 should, I should change that. I think I will, I will, you will keep seeing this because I copy and paste, huh? so that's, that's, that's a mistake, guys. I apologize for this, it has to be 2.7 on, huh? okay. Okay, one more thing, shop calibration. What's the shop calibration? Before the service company moves your tool to the field to do your measurement, they calibrate the tool. They calibrate on what? They calibrate on rocks and tank of water. They calibrate on rocks filled with water and they calibrate in tanks filled with water. So what is the fluid they use for calibration? Water. For both the neutron and the density. Remember, okay? When you go for calibration, before, you, before the tool moves, <coughs> the service company yard goes to the field, it has to be calibrated, making sure it reads properly. Be calibrated on either 100% water tank or rock with 100% water saturated, okay, or both, okay. Right. So the calibration is density and neutron tools are calibrated before going to the field. The calibration rock is filled with water. Then your raw fluid has to be water. No choice because you calibrated your tool on water then my raw fluid is not any fluid. It has to be what? One. Then my density porosity is raw bulk minus 2.71 divided by one minus 2.71. Okay? Again, I again, just remind you every time that this should be two. Raw bulk minus 2.71 divided by one minus 2.71. Am I clear? So now the density porosity became dependent mainly, mainly on the density value because it has to be on a limestone scale. So you have no choice for raw matrix. It is calibrated on water. So you have no choice for raw fluids. Raw fluids is one. Okay. Am I clear on this? Let's continue. Okay. What's the maximum porosity in any rock? Well, it's 47.6%. Let's make it easy. We'll make it 45. No, no, it will never happen. It will never reach 46, 40, uh, 47. Let's make it 45. Just, just be a, a good number. Just, just for simplicity. Okay? okay? Look at this, guys. What is the, cal, let's just cal, calculate the density using this equation. What, what is the density? You put density porosity as 0. Point, we need consistency. We need consistency. So 45, we'll put 0 0.45 in the density equation. You go and, ca and calculate the raw bulk. If you look, calculate the raw bulk is 1.95. So if you put the porosity in the density equation as 0 0.45, so 
So what is the row in this case? 1.95. That's why on the scale of the neutron, you see at 45, we have 1.95. So 1.95 coming by using 2.71 and using one and use this porosity to come up with this scale. So this scale is not out of your choice. No, it has to be this scale. You cannot change this scale for consistency. Everybody understand that? So the scale of the density is not a choice. The scale of the density is calculated based on what? Based on the scale of the neutron. Based on the scale of the neutron. So when I put the 0 0.45, density became 1.95. So I have to stick with this number, 1.95. Keep going. What is the maximum density we encounter? Maximum density we encounter, we encounter is anhydrite, 2.98. Okay, let's just go for the den, we'll make it 2.95 for simplicity, why? 1.95, make it 2.95, so the span will be one gram per cc. If you put 2.98, it will be 1.03, it doesn't look nice. So 0.45 came up with 1.95, just make the other one 2.95, okay? Let's just use the 2.95 in the density equation and calculate the porosity. Now, here is my density, 2.98 or 2.95, uh, it should be 2.95, 2.95 minus 2.71 divided by 1 minus 2.71. And you calculate the porosity, now the porosity is negative 50. And that's why if you need to have 2.98, your scale on the Newton has to extend to negative 15. Not because the neutron is calculating negative porosity, because of the consistency with the density porosity. Density porosity is the one that's wrong, not the neutron porosity. Don't ever think the neutron will read negative. It will never do this, okay? Because neutron is actually responding only, only to hydrogen and the atom atomic structure <coughs> of your rock, okay? It will never read negative porosity, never, okay? Unless it's a different type of rock. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in, in, in a second. So why the negative porosity here in the neutron scale? But not because the neutron will read negative. It will never happen. That's driven by the consistency of the scale with the density. Why I have to go to 2.95? Because I need to capture what? I need to capture anhydrite on density. I need to see the anhydrite on the density. Anhydrite is very heavy, 2.95. Now you go back and calculate what is the corresponding porosity, okay? On the porosity scale that makes the two scales consistent. The consistency comes so that the negative 15 is not the neutron porosity. It's the corresponding density porosity related to anhydrite, okay? Everybody understand that. <clears throat> so... The scale is then covers all processes from 0 to 45 and covers all lithology from 1.95 to 2.95. What is the negative 15? It's a must have for consistency because of the density process, not because of the neutron process. Clear. Everybody understand that? It's because of the density process. Okay? Let me prove this to you. Example, identify anhydride zone on the neutron density log. Here's, here is the neutron density log. How can I identify anhydride? First of all, it's very dense. Density has to be very high. What is the scale of the density? 2.95. What is the density of anhydride? 2.98. Then the anhydride will read very high. It has to hit what? It has to hit the 2.95. Look at this. Here is your density right there. It's hitting what? 2.9, the red, the red, the, the, the red the, um, uh, log is the density. So your red is reading 2.95, it's right there. So this zone is anhydride zone. This little piece of us is also anhydride zone. So the anhydride is here. So I identified the anhydride, okay? Let's look at <coughs> the neutron. Okay, first of all, what is anhydride? To understand the neutron response, this just understand the, 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 the if the anhydride will have hydrogen, then it will read prost. 
If it doesn't have hydrogen, it should not read any frost whatsoever. It should read zero. Okay? What is anhydrite? Okay, anhydrite is calcium sulfate. Calcium sulfate is CaSO4. This is the calcium sulfate. Okay? So it has what? It has calcium like limestone, but it has another element. It's called what? Sulfur. Called sulfur. Is there any hydrogen in the anhydrite? Any, any H here? Okay. So the anhydrite should read zero porosity. Don't ever think that the neutron tool will read negative porosity. Never. All right? Neutron response to hydrogen. Is there any hydrogen in this composition? No. It should read zero. It should read zero. Okay? Right. Look at this. Here is the scale of what, what is, which one is the neutron? The green. Look at the green. Here is the zero. Here is the zero point. Negative 15. Here is the zero point. Look at this. Let me go back. Let me go back. Here is the zero. It reads zero. It does not read negative. It does not read negative 15. It's actually calculated negative 15 from the density process. It's not a measured negative 15. Everybody understand that? It's calculated from the density. It has nothing to do with the neutron. And why we allow this to happen? Consistency is, uh, is forcing us to do this. Consistency in the scale is forcing us to do this. Everybody understand that? So it actually reads zero. Now, it may read a negative one. Let's, 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 let's just pay attention to this. It may read a negative one. <coughs> Why is that? <coughs> well, if you look at the composition, because of the slowing down power, remember this equation? Right? When we see a difference in atomic mass number, then the energy lost by the collision is different. We found that the energy lost by a single collision, collision with calcium is 97. Okay, so E final is 97% of the A initial. So you lose 3%. We found it's 95% with silicon. So it loses 5%. It's different. How about sulfur? Okay. Sulfur is CaSO4. Okay. What about S of sulfur? It's 32. Is it similar to calcium? No. Calcium is 40. Calcium is 40. So because sulfur is different from calcium, it's lower than calcium. That's why its porosity is lower than calcium. So lower with a little bit, not negative 15. Okay? So it is lower because the atomic mass is lower. The atomic mass is lower compared to what? Compared to calcium. Not because it's heavy. Nothing to do of being heavy. Not, nothing to do with being 2.98. It does, neutron does not reflect to this. Neutron tool does not reflect to density. Neutron tool reflects to collisions. Collision with certain mass. This mass is atomic mass. If the atomic mass is heavy, it doesn't lose much. If the atomic mass is light, <coughs> it loses more. Okay? So the difference in the atomic mass will create the discrepancy. Okay. Let, let me prove this some more. Every service company will have what they call a chart book. Chart book, they actually put all the minerals and the corresponding neutron porosity, density porosity, and so on, or density and so on. If you look at the anhydride, <coughs> here is the composition, CaSO4, as we discussed before. What's the, what's the porosity there? It's negative one. Why? Because sulfur is 32, less than what? Less than 40. If 40 will give you the zero, okay? 40 will give you the zero because we actually scaled it on, 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 on calcium carbonate. So 40 of calcium will give you the zero. Anything below this will give you a negative, okay? Right. How about sandstone? Let's look at the sandstone. Sandstone is silicon dioxide, and we said that the silicon is 28. It's lower than 40 or higher than 40? It's lower than 40. Then it has to read negative. Sandstone will read negative? Yes, the sandstone will read negative. Okay? Sandstone is very light. It's 2.65. How come it reads negative? Some people say, oh, the, the anhydrite needs negative because it's heavy. No, it's not. 
Sandstone is 2.65. If you look at the scale here, it's negative one as well. So silicon dioxide is negative one. Why? Because silicon is 28. It's lower than 40. Has nothing to do with the density of the silicon. Nothing to do with the density of the silicon dioxide. Everybody understand that? So neutron tool does not respond to density. Neutron tool responds to slowing down, to effect of energy, to the mass of the atomic mass of the, of the molecule. Let's take another example, dolomite. Is dolomite heavier than limestone or lighter? Dolomite is heavier. Dolomite is 2.87. What is the reading of dolomite? It's reading positive 0.9. It's almost positive 1. It's heavier, but it's reading positive. Okay? So the idea of being heavier to read negative is wrong. Lime, that dolomite is heavier than limestone, and it needs positive. It doesn't read negative. Why? This is understand why. Here is the composition of the, the, the dolomite. It's calcium carbonate, okay? Add to this magnesium. That's what the dolomite is. You add magnesium to the calcium carbonate. When you add magnesium, are you taken away from the calcium or adding? You're adding. That's why it's more than the 40, okay? It makes it more than the 40. That's why it's... It's positive, it's not negative. Everybody understand that. So that's the mechanism of the neutron tool. Okay? When I actually put this question, I knew that you guys will not get this in, in, in details, but at least to stimulate your, your mind. I hope that actually satisfies everybody. And before we go to the water saturation. Nihal. Yes, sir. Question? Yeah, I just want to applaud you for, for explaining in this uh, perfect way. It was amazing, you know. I always knew, knew it was calculated, but this was a whole new level. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, so uh, someone is, uh, we have a lot of question, questions, actually. Uh, someone is asking, what about the sonic log? Uh, we can measure the porosity with sonic log by interval transient time. Say it again, I can't, I can't hear you, everyone. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, someone is saying, what, what about sonic log? I think this is the part where you said uh, how we can measure porosity. Uh, so, so it's asking we can measure porosity uh, by um, utilizing the sonic log. By sonic log. Oh, transit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay let, me, let, yeah. Me, let me comment on the sonic before, you, before we go to the next one. Actually, yeah, sonic, sure. log, sonic log is a little bit of a difficult thing to use. The reason is the sonic log is not only affected by the enter. You see, in your reservoir, you can have two types of porosities. One of them is called, we call it intergranular porosity. The second one, we call it secondary porosity. Secondary exactly. porosity means it's not intergranular. It's not made by grains. It's made by fractures. It's made by, by dissolution. Okay? It's made by chemical reaction that actually eats your grains and makes like a, like, a, like a vuggy type thing. So the vugs and the fractures are type of porosity, but not, not coming from the deposition. It's coming from stresses and chemical reactions. Okay? Then the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the sonic tool is more affected by that type of porosity. Okay? So the sonic tool, when you, when you measure porosity out of the sonic tool, you need to be very, very, very careful. Not many people would like you to do this, okay? Not many people. Will. If this is really can replace the neutron, then everybody will replace the neutron. Not because we don't like the neutron, because the neutron has a radioactive source. We don't like having radioactive source in the well bore. Remember this. This is safety issue. If the tool got stuck, oh, it's a lot of issue in, on, on the rig. You have to... You have to put a semen plug. You have to do so many things. You have to bury the source. So many issues. Okay. So if the sonic can replace the neutron, should have done it long, long ago, and we we'll get this one away. There is one that can replace the neutron. It's called the nuclear magnetic resonance, but that's a different technology. Okay, and it requires certain type of skills, and also it's more expensive. For example. You run the nuclear magnetic resonance for twenty thousand dollars. 
you run the the, the neutron tool for three thousand dollars. So not your manager will not allow you to run the nuclear magnetic resonance because of the difference in price. But it can replace the neutron tool, and also it replaces. It doesn't have <clears throat> doesn't have any uh, radioactive source to be much safer. Okay. Yeah? So bottom line, no, you cannot replace the sonic uh, the the density with the sonic because it is it is a different type of measurement and it's highly affected by a secondary process. <laughs> Yeah. Sure, we have a lot of questions for a Q&A session, you know, like we're, we're answering questions and having questions over the questions, so. Okay. Uh, so someone is, is asking a very interesting question, actually, uh, how the counts of collisions with hydrogen are translated numerically to porosity in neutron? Is there is an equation? The calculated uh, energy? <laughs> The, the counts of collision with hydrogen are translated yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Actually, uh, that's, uh, that's a good question, quite frankly. Actually, when we design the tools, okay, uh, my, uh, my PhD actually was designing a neutron tool, okay? When you design a tool, we use a certain type of mathematical model called Monte Carlo modeling, okay? Monte Carlo modeling actually takes the neutron and go behind it step by step, with calculating probability of hitting certain elements, okay? Depends on so many factors in the formation. When the, uh, the service company design their tools, they design them on this type of modeling. Yes, we follow the neutron from the birth till the death, and we call it that way, from birth to death, okay? We follow the neutron, we count how many how many collisions per neutron, and that's actually how the, new, how the service company come with their charts. Their charts are based on this type of modeling. Very famous uh, methodology that everybody now is using in different directions, but it's mainly the Monte Carlo modeling is the one we you look at or we use for designing the uh, neutron tools, and it follows the neutron form, as I said, in every collision, and you can calculate energy and number of collision and distribution of collision and distribution of energy so many output that you can get out of this so yeah we do that okay last question uh someone is asking if the scale of the porosity or, or the value of porosity never exceeds the 47 percent why the scale is from zero to 60. no from zero to 60 is the difference as, as i said if in, in the limestone <coughs> in the limestone uh we go, we go from negative 15 to 45. In the sandstone, it's from zero to 60. The reason is, look at the density, when we actually look at the density, we had 1.95 to 2.95, correct? So the span is, the span is one gram per cc, correct? 1.95, 2.95. So the difference is one gram per cc. When they try to go and put the same scale on sandstone, so they use the scale 1.65, 2.65, okay? Why 2.65 is the maximum density of, of the sand. <clears throat> the, you subtract to one, you will get 1.65. If you use these two scales and you go to the calculation of porosity, from the density porosity, you will get zero to 60. So zero to 60 is again, because of consistency on sandstone scale, not on limestone scale. If you look at the scale 0 to 60, you'll find that the density 1.65, 2.65. It's not going to be 1.95, 2.95. To be 1.65, 2.65. To be consistent with 1.95, 2.65, uh, 2.65, your scale has to be 0 to 60. Because we did the same. To be consistent, 1.95, 2.95 in limestone, our scale has to be negative 15 to 45. Okay? All right. okay any yeah, we can, no, we can go on to the can next Can we take part. five minutes break to make a cup of uh, coffee or a cup of tea or something and uh, get some uh, some water? Yeah, sure. Sure. Of course. Just five, and, uh, I also need the rest to stretch a little bit. Okay? Okay, you guys. Stretch and tell us what, what he did. Just, uh, you know, get down and give us five push-ups and, and we'll come in five minutes, inshallah. So, let's go to the water saturation now.
Also, I got some questions about water saturation. Right? One of the question is, uh, what is the limit clay percent to use Archie? What equation if the formation of water is fresh? Was SW an unconventional? Uh, what's the Orabi method? <laughs> okay. So uh, what's the SW and unconventional? Uh, we'll talk to Dr. Uh, Ahmed just to uh, to have another webinar. It's, it's, it's a long story. Uh, the reason is, let me just uh, comment on this unconventional a little bit. If you go to Archie equation or any saturation equation, it requires porosity. And we agreed in the unconventional reservoir, there is nothing called porosity. Okay? There's a, there's a, there's a desorption and, and, and adsorption. Okay? It's layered. There is no porosity in unconventional reservoir. If you have some porosity in unconventional reservoir, you're lucky. Normally, if there is no porosity in unconventional reservoir. We are not looking for porosity in unconventional reservoir. We're looking for layers, okay? The layers that contains the organic material, right? So since there is no porosity by definition in unconventional reservoir, and all the saturation models that we use are dependent on porosity, then all the saturation models we use in conventional reservoir cannot be applied in unconventional reservoir. We have to have another way of calculating water saturation in unconventional reservoir, and that requires some other tools. One of them is called the electromagnetic magnetic propagation tool. We have to introduce this tool that you guys need to understand it first before we talk about unconventional reservoir. So that's, that's a different subject. I will not be able to cover it today. Okay. So I'll cover the other two. Or the other three. Uh, first one is the clay percent. Uh, actually, the answer to this one is if, if your clay percent is less than 10%, it's probably the limit for RC. That may change, depends on your reservoir and your experiences in your reservoir. Okay. So 10%, uh, you, can, you can take it as the limit. If your uh, clay is less than 10%, go ahead and use RC. If it's more than 10%, then the error of RC would be high. Archie will show you higher water saturation than the actual because of the effect of the clays. What, what is the effect of clays? Clays will lower your, your resistivity because clays are conductive. So the existence of clay will lower your resistivity. When your resistivity is low to any of the saturation models, it means water is there. And that's a false indication because low resistivity can be either water or clay. Since Archie does not have clay component in, its, in his equation, then Archie would be really bad. It will overestimate your water saturation. That's why you need to find a different met method, like Siemens Do or Waxman Smiths or Do or Water, whatever the model that you would be applying. Okay? And there are so many, many models in, in saturation. Right? So that, that, that goes for the first one. 10% uh, is a limit. You may need to go lower than this. You may go, need to go higher than this. It depends actually on your reservoir. For example, there's some some other some type of clays that that you can go a little bit higher than 10%. All right. So that that depends on your experience. And that depends on your reservoir. So there's not really a a, a, a a cut for all reservoirs. It's reservoir dependent. All right. Fresh water formation. <clears throat> Fresh water formation is a big issue. Why? Because remember, freshwater means water that does not have salt in there. Remember when we calculated our W uh, in the, in the, in the uh, log analysis uh, webinar, we said our W is a function of salinity. More salinity you have, lower our W will be. So the, the, R, the salinity will decrease your resistivity of water. The resistivity of hydrocarbon is very high because hydrocarbon is not conductive, it's resistive. That's why we take the differentiation. So if the water is not conductive, if the water is fresh and not conductive, easily the tool will be confused. Is this high resistivity coming from the non-conductive water or coming from the non-conductive hydrocarbon? That's the dilemma. Okay, so the dilemma come, is coming from the higher resistivity of the fresh water. It's confusing. When I see high resistivity, I'm confused. Is it because the fresh water there or because of the hydrocarbon? Nobody can answer that. Okay? And not, none of these, uh, the saturation equations using resistivity will be able to answer this. So <clears throat> calculating water saturation using resistivity-based uh, 
models like Archie or even modified Archie will result in a big mistake. Okay, all right. So that's why people try to find different way of doing this. Right. The different way is <clears throat> so you cannot actually do this. Uh, this is the recipe situation. You cannot do that. There is a tool called carbon oxygen tool. I will talk a little bit briefly on carbon oxygen tool to show you what how this tool actually works without going into detail. Carbon oxygen tool is the tool that we use in case of fresh water. But this tool has limitations, and I'll tell you why Arabi came with this idea to overcome the drawback of the of the carbon oxygen. Carbon oxygen is a very interesting tool that actually works well in certain situations, and it doesn't work well in many, many situations. Okay, let me, let me go through one by one here. What is the carbon oxygen tool? Let's go back to see what we need to know. We need to know the amount of water versus the, to the amount of hydrocarbon inside the pore space. Okay. In the resistivity, we took advantage of water is conductive, uh, hydrocarbon is resistive. That's in salt water formation. In fresh water formation, that differentiation doesn't exist anymore. Okay. So we, can, we cannot use the resistivity as, as I explained before. For the carbon oxygen, say it says, okay, hydrocarbon is composed of what? It's composed of carbon and hydrogen. True? Okay. Water is composed of what? It's composed of oxygen and hydrogen. So they both have hydrogen, but they are different in what? This one has carbon and this one has oxygen. Clear? What if I am capable of measuring the number of carbon atoms inside the pore? and measuring the number of oxygen atoms inside the pore, then carbon will be related to hydrocarbon. Oxygen will be relating to water. Then I can say, okay, if we measure the number of carbon atoms and the number of oxygen atoms, simply the hydrocarbon will be carbon atoms divided by the carbon plus oxygen. That's the that's a hydrocarbon. That's S hydrocarbon. Okay? So the carbon atoms divided by the sum of carbon and oxygen. So this means this is oil divided by total. Oil divided by total gives me saturation. Okay. So the percent of oil divided by the total gives me the percent of the number of atoms of oil divided by the total atoms of hydrogen. And, I'm sorry, of, uh, of oxygen and carbon. This will give me the hydrocarbon saturation. How can I get water saturation? It's simply one minus hydrocarbon saturation. So the tool, in principle, it's very simple tool. In principle, I can measure. Can you measure the number of, of carbon? Yes, I can measure the carbon. Okay. Let me give you a very small background on this. <clears throat> when God created the universe, okay, the universe is very unique. Everybody is unique. For example, if I have multiple students in my class, I can easily know everybody by the fingerprint. Every, all, every one of us has a different fingerprint, correct? So now if we take fingerprints of everybody, then I have a fingerprint, I compare it to the rest of the class, I know this fingerprint is for uh, Muhammad, this is for Mahmoud, this is for whoever, okay? So fingerprints is what defines us between ourselves. When the science get advanced, DNA is now used to identify, to have a DNA print. Now, if you go to the, at the airport, even I has an eye print. To have an eye print, you look, you look at a certain uh, uh, apparatus in the, uh, at the airport, they actually take an eye print because it actually appears now that even I can differentiate on one person from another. So you can differentiate by fingerprints if you are very, very low in technology. You can differentiate by DNA if a little bit high in technology. If you are higher in technology, you can go even by, by the eye print. So every one of us, we all human, but we can differentiate a human from a human by, by the prints, either fingerprints, eye prints, or DNA. When God created the rock, it's the same thing. Calcium has a fingerprint. Oxygen has a fingerprint. They actually go measure that fingerprint without going into details what is the fingerprint. Forget about that. But there, every atom has a certain fingerprint. And we measure that fingerprint. 
that relates to that specific atom. So if I see that fingerprint, I know it's coming from carbon. If I see that fingerprints, I know it's coming from oxygen. So I count the fingerprints coming from carbon, fingerprints coming from oxygen, then I get the, the total, then I can calculate the saturation. Very simple, okay? If this is that simple, <coughs> so what are the issues here? Then you ask them, why Orab is developing a model if carbon oxygen works? That's a waste of time. A waste of time for himself, a waste of time for the industry. Why are we doing this? If there is a tool that can do that, okay? Let me tell you why he came up with this, right? Simply because carbon oxygen is not accurate. Why the carbon oxygen is not accurate? Let's take an example, okay? You see the, the word why here? Why is always the solution, okay? Remember when we were, when we were talking about, uh, about, about the absolute permeability, and we talked about Darcy, and Darcy used what? Used liquid, and he actually put some constraints on liquid. It has to be incompressible, but we found that Klingenberg said, Mr. Darcy, if I use your method, I will be staying my lifetime waiting for the results. Because that for the liquid to penetrate my rock in the lab, it takes a day. I will use a, some, something that's even faster, which is gas. But Mr. Darcy told him that, well, gas is not an incompressible fluid. He said, well, I will do the trick. And we discussed the trick and we, saw, we found that Klingenberg was a smart guy and he overcame the issue. And he actually now we can measure permeability in seconds using his methodology that actually, if you compare it, it you, you measure the permeability of a plug in a day using Darcy. So there is always a reason for developing more accuracy. The carbon oxygen tool is not accurate. Let me give you an idea. Why is that? Let's go that you run the tool in sandstone. What's sandstone? It's silicon dioxide. Oh, silicon dioxide has what? Has oxygen. Will the tool say, oh, I need to look at the oxygen coming from water and the oxygen coming from, silic from, from uh, silicon dioxide? It doesn't do this. Oxygen is oxygen. It has the same fingerprint. So this oxygen will be counted as oxygen coming from the formation. The tool will never be able to differentiate oxygen from water from oxygen coming from the rock. So you have extra oxygen coming from, from the rock. Right? If you go and run this in limestone, what's limestone? Calcium carbonate. There is a carbon here. Okay? Oh, will the tool say, I will not cover, I will not count this carbon because it's coming from the rock? The tool doesn't do this. Carbon that lives in the rock it has the same fingerprint that's similar to the carbon that lives in, in the fluid. It's carbon, it's a family of carbon. So carbon has the same fingerprint. Is there a difference? I don't know. There is no difference until the, uh, today in science didn't discover uh, how to differentiate the two different carbons. It's not there. We all look at carbon as certain fingerprint regardless where carbon is coming from. So this one will give you a problem. You will have carbon coming from uh, uh, carbon dioxide, I'm sorry, the calcium carbonate, and also oxygen. So you have carbon and oxygen also counted as carbon and oxygen. So you need to do corrections. A lot of corrections, quite frankly. These corrections makes the carbon-oxygen tool very inaccurate. All right? Because it depends now how you correct for it. It depends on your information of the reservoir. If I go and run in any reservoir, I have no clue if this reservoir is sandstone or limestone or dolomite or does it have carbon from here, does it have oxygen from there. It's a mess. Okay? So carbon oxygen requires a very well a specialized interpreter to be able to do this. <laughs> very big problem that the industry is facing with the carbon oxygen because it's difficult to interpret because of the interference from other elements that has nothing to do with your hydrocarbon. Oxygen from silicon dioxide has nothing to do with the hydrocarbon. Carbon from the carb calcium carbonate has nothing to do with the hydrocarbon. So you need to correct for him, and the correction for him is so difficult and <laughs> creates a lot of issues in, in running this tool. All right? So that's what the driver to develop a different thing. Okay. <laughs> the accuracy of, of the carbon oxygen, I don't want to comment on this. Uh, I don't want any service company to be mad at me. 
but it's uh, it's really very questionable. It's very very questionable, right? So what did Rabbi do? What he did, he says, okay, I will use a combination of two tools, okay, or two measurements. I will use resistivity and density, or resistivity and sun. Okay, what you gonna do with these two? Look at this trick here, right? Here is actually the resistivity and sonic. See, these two are plotted on the same track. Resistivity and sonic are plotted on the same track. Resistivity is a function of hydrocarbon. Sonic is a function of hydrocarbon because sonic also measures flows. So sonic will measure flows and resistivity will measure flows. Now, if you overlay these two on the same track, Adjusting the track, similar to what we do in the neutron density. Adjusting the track to, to be showing no separation where, is, where there is no hydrocarbon. Showing no separation where there is no hydrocarbon. Okay? How can I find this out? Look at this zone right here. Okay? Look at this zone. The porosity here is reading what? It is the negative 15. Porosity is reading what? It is reading zero. Porosity here is reading zero. You will find any hydrocarbon in a zero porosity? No. So this means there should not be any separation between the two laws. So what you do, you go and find a zone that has no porosity whatsoever and make sure that your, your density, and your, your sonic, and your resistivity absolutely is showing no separation whatsoever in front of a zone that has no way to have any hydrocarbon. Okay? So that's what happens here. You overlay, we overlay it at this point until we have no separation. Change the scale okay, of the density, or of the, I'm sorry, of the sonic to make sure that the overlay here. Once you see separation, that's an indication of hydrocarbon. Has nothing to do with the water being fresh, water being sold, has nothing to do with this. Okay? If you have hydrocarbon, you will see separation. So that separation here, we go and try to quantify this separation. When you quantify this separation, you calculate water situation based on how separate they are, because if there is no separation, it's 100% water because there is no process. Okay? If there is some separation, then you, here is a comparison between the two measurements, the two calculations. The, the blue one is from Orabi's method, and the red one is from Siemendo, and you can see the agreement very well. Siemendo requires knowing A, M, N, and RW. Orabi doesn't require this at all. No A, no M, no N, no RW. And you can see they are in a very good agreement, okay, showing that this, this, uh, uh, relationship works and works really well. So if you use this overlay method with the quantification of the separation, it's a direct measurement of how much hydrocarbon you have and how much uh, 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 water you have. Okay? Sometimes you see a little bit of difference. Okay? Nobody leaves these differences. The reason is, when you actually calculate water saturation from Arabi's method, you can back calculate what the value of M. You can see the variation of M. This is the, this is the black, black, black line. The black line is the variation of M. M is not two. M is changing from 1.9 to 2.1. If you fix the value of M, that's the error coming from Siemendo. Siemendo equation is fixing M value to be two, and that's why you see the differences. So that's why, Orabi is a little bit different from Siemendo because Siemendo is fixing M value, but Orabi does not require any, any M value. Okay? All right? So this is the comparison here between two, and that's, that's the reason of the little bit differences here between, between the two methods. Right? This is already published in a paper, if you guys are interested in, it's published in a paper which is called the, in the Journal of Petroleum Exploration and Production Technology. It's already published about three weeks ago. So you go, go ahead and read it. If you are interested, because someone is asking about the equations, and I said, guys, never, ever, ever, ever ask about the equations before you understand, all right? So here is, here is the list of the equation, how we calculate the separate, how, how we quantify the separation between 
which is the delta, the delta, the separation between the resistivities and the sonic. And here is the final, final model based on that separation, the calculated separation gives you the S hydrocarbon. This is the S hydrocarbon and one minus S hydrocarbon is the S depth. So this is, this is the equation that you use, but to use this equation, you have to calculate, the, you have to quantify the separation between the sonic and, and the resistivity or between the density and, and the resistivity. I prefer to use sonic over density every time. If you need to use this, this equation or this methodology, you need actually to use the sonic because sonic is deeper. Density is shallow. And if, you, if your reservoir is invaded somehow, then the density will be affected because the density will be reading the flush zone. It's not the actual uh, reservoir. The, the sonic is a very deep, it's about two feet deeper, so it's away from, from the invaded zone. So that's why I always prefer using the density over, I'm sorry, using the sonic over, over the density. So the advantage of the Arabis method, no need for A, N, M, or R, W. You don't need this. Actually, this is needed for Archie and all modified Archie. Arabi does not require any V clay, which is needed for all modified uh, Archie model. And as you, as you see, I never, I don't calculate any type of V clay. I don't need A, M, N, R, W. And you come up with a very, very close value to semen dough that has to have A, M, N, R, W, and V clay. Rabi's method is based actually the, the, the same idea was developed earlier by a guy named Passy, but he did it for unconventional reservoir. And what I did is I took that idea and I applied this in conventional reservoir. So Passy is the developer of this separation idea, but he did not do it in, in, in conventional reservoir. He did it for unconventional reservoir. So this is the modification of Passy. If you, if you go and look at uh, the title of of the uh, paper, to be, uh, to be fair to the guy, it's a non archi water saturation method for conventional reservoirs based on generalization of PASI, total organic carbon model for unconventional reservoir. And that's tell you something here, guys. If somebody did something, you have to give him the credit. Okay? Even if you modify this method, you have to give him the credit. That's, that's, that's the honesty of, of all the scientists. If the guy came up with the idea, he did it, he applied this idea in another field, which is the unconventional reservoir. If you're capable of to take this and, and apply it in the conventional reservoir, you have to give the credit to the first one who, who thought about this idea, okay? All right, so this idea is actually based on, on, uh, on PASI. Right. Any question? Mm, yeah, we have a couple. Right. Uh, so someone is asking, is the fingerprint XRD or other spectrals? No, fingerprint is the is the energy of the gamma ray emitted by each element after excitation, not XRD. Okay. Uh, another question: If we have the concentration of silicon, we can subtract the amount of oxygen that will combine with silicon, right? Same for carbon with calcium. Yeah, that's what that's what the service company do, but it actually depends on how much silicon do you have, and I can give you a million dollars if you can assume this. Okay. If you can come up with this number, it's a million dollars from my pocket. Okay. So, uh, how do you know when to use the carbon oxygen tool? Uh, actually, if you are in a reservoir that has, first of all, very uniform rock, so your correction would be uniform. Okay, so in this case, you have a high chance of uh, getting good results. Uh, some actually, they use calibrated, the calibrated to core and take a look at the, how the calibration goes. Third is that you have to run it when you are sure 100% there is no invasion, because the depth of investigation of the carbon oxygen tool is very, very shallow. It took about three inches. If you are in an invaded zone, then God help you. It's, it's, it's not, not going to give you any, any good saturation. Okay, great. Now we can proceed to the next part. Okay. <laughs> Actually, there was a very interesting question came from a, a guy. I really like the question because he was asking about principles. He needs to understand the principle of the measurement. Okay. He was saying that uh, if you explain in brief regarding understanding of frequencies we used in resistivity logging regarding depth of investigation. I really like that question very much because it's, it's, it's something about what is, what is the relationship between frequency and, 
and depth of investigation. What, 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 what is the relationship here? I'll make it even more complicated, okay? I'll ask, I will complicate the question a little bit, but I will, I will give you the, the answer at the, at, the, at the end, okay? When we, measure, when we measure the resistivity using electromagnetic waves, okay? Especially if we have resistive mud, because if you are in a resistive mud, you cannot use the lateral tool. Lateral tool uses Ohm's law. And Ohm's law requires a conductive mud for the current to flow from the well bore to the formation. When you have resistive mud, like oil-based mud, freshwater mud, if you have resistive mud, the current will not, then you need to find something else that can propagate, okay? The something else that can propagate is the electromagnetic wave. And we agreed on this, all right? And actually, if you look at this, here is the tool that we talked about before that has transmitters. Here are the transmitter and has receivers. They transmit what? They transmit electromagnetic wave, okay? Electromagnetic wave is taking a shape of what? Of a sine wave. What does it mean? How come a wave will be represented by a sine, wave, a sine function? Who said that a wave is a sine function? And anybody, uh, I want to throw this question, uh, uh, Nihal, to, to, the, uh, to the students here. Anybody know what, what is the relationship between a wave? For example, let me give an example. If I take a piece of, of rock, I'm at the beach enjoying myself in the summer. We're all now in the summer here. If there is no COVID-19, then we'll be, all of us will be on the beach. We're not going to be sitting here with, with, with Dr. Ahmed Al-Garhi. I, I will be on the beach enjoying myself. But anyways, if you take a piece of rock, and you throw it in the water, you're generating what? Generating waves. What the shape of the wave will look like? Circles. Circle, the center of the circle will be what? The center of the circle will be my point where the, the, the rock hit the water, and you see circle. How come a circle will be presented by a sine wave? What, who said that the, the wave should be represented by a sine wave? That's a question that you guys need to think about. Why a wave is represented by a sinusoidal equation? Why is that? Who said that this is a good representation of a wave? If, even if you look at the, uh, the radio station or TV stations, okay, when you look at the antenna, they look at the antenna as spheres coming around from, from the top of the antenna. Nobody said that the wave is a sine, sine equation. How come we represent the wave as a sine equation? Is anybody can answer that question even quickly? Can, can uh, did anybody answer that question, uh, Nihal? If you can, you guys, uh, answer it in the chat box. Is it, is it possible? I, I mean, can anybody explain why, why the, the wave can be presented by a sine function? Someone is asking, the, uh, is actually answering, sorry, not asking. The circles are actually the wave fronts. So what? How can a wave front would be presented by a sine function? Okay. Okay. I have no further answers. I will answer. It is a very nice little girl sitting here, and she's watching what? She's watching the wave. Look at the wave around it. It's what? It's circles. It's actually surrounded by the circles. Okay. So is the circle actually a sine wave? Is the circle a sine function? You just, you just see this, okay? Here is a circle. What is a circle? Circle is actually a motion on the XY plane. And whatever happens in this circle can happen in every circle. And the sphere is multiple circles with different diameters. You can take a cross section everywhere. It's multiple circles with different diameters. So a circle will be a good representation, okay? Now, let's just look at how can I draw a circle? Watch this carefully, guys. How can I draw a circle? First, I will start with a point, this red point right here. This point is on the x-axis. So the angle of this point on the x-axis is zero. Correct? To actually, and, and that length here represents the radius of the circle. All right? To draw the circle, I need to move with angles, but with the same radius. So a movement of, of the of angle with the same radius will actually create the circle, okay? 
and the projection here will be a value on the y-axis. Projection of this this radius will be on y-axis here, right? All right. So let's just draw this on the x, y. Okay. Where is the the x will be representing the angle? Y will be representing the projection. Okay. So at this point, what is the angle? Zero. What's y? Zero. So the first point is zero, zero. Second point, which is theta one, okay? What is the y in this case? Y one. So at theta one, there is a y one. All right? Let's continue moving. You move on theta two with the same radius to draw a circle, okay? Then you have angle theta two, which has a projection of y two. Now you go for the 90 degrees. You have an angle of 90 degree and a maximum y. Increase the angle more than 90 degree, okay? Then your actually angle is increased, but your y is decreasing. Projection will be decreasing. That's why y is going down. Increase the angle. Look at the projection. Go 180. Go back to the, to the x-axis. Now increase over one, uh, uh, 180. Now your y will be going on the negative, okay? Y will be going in the negative y. So increasing the angle will give you on a negative y. Keep going, keep going until you can finish drawing your circle. Ah, now we know why they have it as a sine wave. So sine wave is simply motion of a point for a, at, a, at a certain the, the, uh, radius going in a circle. So sine wave is a representation of a circle. That's why we always use sine wave as the wave representing the actual circle moving in earth or moving in water. So that's why we have this kind of representation. Everybody understand that? Again, never ever take things for granted. You have to understand why we're doing this, why we're using the sine wave to represent a wave, sine function to represent a wave. You have to ask that question before you even start thinking of a wave. Okay, All right. So this is a sine function. How about this this value? This value is is uh, your maximum radius. This is your radius. How about if I have a bigger circle? You have a bigger sine wave. That's it. Or, or the the thing will be the amplitude will be bigger. How about if I have a, a smaller one? So that's why when you look at the sphere, cut the sphere into cross section. Each cross section will be a circle with a different diameter. Okay, so all these circles will be represented by multiple sine waves representing the 360 degrees motion of any wave whatsoever, regardless being a wave in the water, wave in an air, a sound wave, it doesn't matter. Okay, right. okay, so now any wave is a sine theta, and this is exactly a motion of a circle. Okay, and that's why we did. We look at this, here is the motion of a circle, it generates sine waves, okay? Motion of circles, it generates sine. That's why we use the sine wave as a representation of it, okay? Right. Frequency and distance. Let's assume I have a distance from A to B. That I'm just now will answer the question of, of, of the guy, and I just uh, got off the uh, the track here just to, to, to show you guys what is the sine wave. Now, I have, a dis I have a, a point A to point B. I need to go from point A to point B, showing that I am a wave going from point A to, up to point B. What's controlling my motion? Okay? The distance is X. And I'm traveling from A to B with a velocity V, which is the velocity of the wave. Regardless, it's a wave in a water, a wave in air, whatever it is. It has a certain velocity. Okay? Okay. I will actually... Travel this x, x distance in a time called t. What's the relationship? t is actually x over v. Okay, this is very simple. x over v gives you gives you the time. Clear? Okay. Now let's just move from this very simplistic to go to the frequency. What's the frequency? Frequency without going into details is the reciprocal of time. We all studied this in a very basic physics. Okay. Is the number of no, number of complete wave in a per second. So that's why it's one of time. So the frequency is one over time. Okay. What is the time here? Is distance over v. 
So let's just substitute this here to, come to now to look at frequencies of a wave and corresponding distances. I have a frequency here and I have a time. Let's just substitute the time as a function of distance. Now here is f, f. f will be v 1 over t. 1 over t is v over x. So f is v over x. So what is x? x is v over f. Look at this. Now, what if you need to increase your distance x? Make your frequency low. If my frequency is low, my distance is very big. If my frequency is high, my distance is very short. And that's exactly the basics of changing frequency to get different depths. Changing frequency to travel different distance. Changing frequency to control the penetration. Okay? So, to need, if you need to see deeper in the formation, simply lower your frequency. Because X is reciprocal to frequency. Lower your frequency, you'll get a very deep measurement. Increase your frequency, you get a very shallow measurement. And that's how we control the shallow, medium, deep in electromagnetic waves. We by controlling frequency, okay? Okay? So the distance is controlled by frequency. Let's go back <clears throat> to, the, to the tool that we designed. This tool has what? Has transmitters. How many transmitters I have? Three. These are the three transmitters. Why having three transmitters? Because I will make one low frequency to measure deep. I'll make the second, the third one high frequency to measure shallow. I'll make the one in the intermediate intermediate frequency to measure the uh, the, the uh, inter inter intermediate. We have shallow, medium, and deep. Okay. So to deliver shallow, go with what? Shallow means increase your frequency. Deep means lower your frequency. Intermediate means use a frequency right in between. Okay. So that's how you control your penetration, depth of penetration by controlling frequency in any in any in any one of these. All right. Any question on this now? Yeah. I think I need to uh, finish quickly because uh, the, the next one is coming. Huh? Now, Lenny, no, any no, no, no questions. Okay. Unconventional reservoirs, guys. Uh, we have so many questions. Unconventional reservoirs. I think, as, as I was saying, that I will talk to Dr. Ahmed and I probably will be uh, will be uh, going through some other uh, webinars uh, later, somewhat some some time later. But one th one thing I want to answer is: Is there any books actually you can start to for unconventional reservoir? Yes, there's a very interesting book here by Stephen Holdridge. Guys, this is a very well known guy. I think he already passed away, unfortunately. He's a very very good guy. Uh, Stephen Holdridge actually wrote a book with, uh, with uh, Zima. Uh, these two wrote a very interesting book called Unconventional Oil and Gas Res uh, Resources Handbook. Go ahead and get a copy of this book, which is a very, very good book for starters. Uh, it doesn't go deeper into details, but at least for a starter, this is a very, very good book. Okay? All right? Actually, I teach this book in the, uh, at the American University. All right. Drilling, also there are some questions on drilling. Uh, again, uh, I don't want to go this uh, through this, but there's something you're talking about nanotechnology. I want to tell you guys that nanotechnology is a very promising technology we all are interested in. Nanotechnology has two different branches of, of, of use, one for the reservoir, and there are some claims that the nanotechnology or the nanoparticles uh, actually, the, actually changes the wettability of the rock. And some are using the nanotechnology to, to change the wettability of the rock to be strong water width. And if, you, if your rock beca beca became strong water width, your recovery factor would increase. Okay? So they use it to increase the recovery factor by changing the wettability to be stronger water width. Okay? This is still under research. Nobody can claim that we, they succeeded in this so far. Okay? The second one is we use it also in the drilling fluid. Uh, and I think I think Engineer Marwa can actually talk about this if uh, if she has some time. Uh, how we use the uh, nanotechnology in designing a better uh, drilling fluid that will not damage the reservoir. Because using nanotechnology uh, or adding nanomaterial into the mud, uh, Halliburton actually did a lot of research on this, and I think there are some good results that show that uh, yeah you can actually control uh, the damage in the reservoir by using the nanotechnology. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm not gonna say more than this uh, for this is a question that has so many parts 
uh, talking about reservoir, oil reservoir, no gas cap, oil reservoir with gas cap, gas reservoir, how to calculate the, how to, how to predict reservoir history during production from pressure, temperature phase diagram. This is a book, man. This is not a question. This requires me to write a book because it's, it's, it's so many angles and that would require a full year, academic year, to go through all your questionnaires here. But I promise you, uh, I will also try to, uh, to at least touch base on these two different types of reservoirs. It's very important if you have gas cap or if you don't have gas cap. But that, that actually shows the driving mechanism in your reservoir and that controls the productivity of your reservoir. This is, this is a very interesting question. And uh, forget about the gas reservoir, it's a different mechanism. But reservoir with gas cap and reservoir with, with not a gas cap, that will control the, uh, the maintaining of pressure and the EOR, uh, EOR uh, projects that we do. Uh, it will control, control that, uh, how, how we uh, produce these reservoirs. So again, I'm not going to go through this in details. We don't have time for that. But at least I promise you we'll, uh, we'll go touch base on these two different type of reservoirs some other time. Right? Thank you very much. I really wish you all guys the best in your career. And I'm very sure we will meet some, some, some time when, uh, when the time allows. And uh, you guys will have some good days in summer. And enjoy your summer. Uh, you, you deserve it, I'm very sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mustafa, for your time and for the great explanations and for answering all the questions. Uh, thank you guys for joining, and we have another webinar in about 20 minutes. So take a break, and we'll see you then. Thank you.